All right, good morning, everyone. Continue to enjoy the food, coffee while we get started. All right, everyone, welcome to the eighth annual SWOG Encore Research Based Clinical Trials Workshop, where we come together to discuss topics related to the conduct of clinical trials in the five SWOG Encore committees. My name is Sam Zingle, and I am a clinical research data coordinator at the SWOG Statistics and Data Management Center in Seattle, Washington. So first off, welcome. This is our first hybrid style meeting uh, for the Encore workshop. Um, the photos shown here were from fall 2019, last time we had the Encore workshop in person. Uh, now in October of 2022, there are fewer faces, uh, more masks, uh, but a lot of you still chiming in from home. Um, we're happy to have you all here, whether it's in person or remote. Um, virtual attendees, um, please just we encourage you to type your questions into the chat today. The SWOG NCORE research base supports the research activities and goals of the NCI NCORE in designing and conducting trials in key focus areas, including cancer prevention, supportive care and symptom management, health related quality of life, and cancer care delivery. In addition, SWOG is committed to addressing cancer disparities, research questions across all studies. By bringing cancer clinical research studies to individuals in their own communities, the NCORE research reflects national diversity so that the evidence generated contributes to improved patient outcomes and reduction in cancer disparities for all people. In-person attendees uh, will have picked up an agenda, study list and feedback form at the sign-in table. Uh, please complete and turn in the feedback form at the end of this session. For our virtual attendees, materials are available on our meetings landing webpage on swag.org. The second page of the agenda contains the continuing education signature form you may use for SOCRA credits. Also, this session is being recorded and slides will be available in the near future. Today's agenda will begin with NCORE Vice Chair Don Hirschman discussing the progress and opportunities for the NCORE research base, followed by three presentations related to various aspects of our trials. We'll learn about the NCI's disparities and in integration efforts, and then hear about SWOG's first large pragmatic trial, which was completed with nearly 4,000 participants. Before launching into our presentations, let's get to know the team behind SWOG and Core Research Base. And working together along with all of you, we achieve so much more than working alone. The SWOG NCORE research base is guided by Vice Chair Dr. Hirschman. Doctors Crew and Sun serve as executive officers for the NCORE research committees. We welcome Dr. Sun, who was appointed recently as Dr. Lyman steps down from that role at the conclusion of this group meeting. We thank Dr. Lyman for his service to the leadership of the Cancer Care Delivery and Symptom Control and Quality of Life committees. There are five scientific SWOG and core research committees with hardworking co-chairs for each. These committees promote and, con and conduct trials to support the NCORE's goals to reduce cancer risk, improve care outcomes, expand access to care, increase quality, quality and balance costs, and reduce cancer disparities. Our team of project managers uh, protocol project managers at the SWOG operations office based in San Antonio, Texas, oversee the critical role for protocol development and maintenance. I also want to mention that the trial development also involves SWOG's financial grant and legal specialists at the group chair's office and the Hope Foundation, who are not pictured here but play an important role in concepts and protocols moving forward. Our NCORE biostatistical leadership resides in Seattle at the SWOG Statistics and Data Management Center, SDMC for short. All of SWOG statisticians are key players in trial design and ensure that trial results are complete, accurate, and reliable. The statistical unit assistants also contribute to many aspects of trial development. 
Many of you have corresponded with clinical research data coordinators who are the liaisons with study site staff. They also review trial data as well as participate in trial development. Whenever you email cancer control question at crab.org, the data coordinators will respond. Our data control technician provides important support and data management activities. And when you call with a protocol or data question, they are the voice that greets you. In addition to the, SWOG, the NCOR research committees, we liaise with three SWOG support committees. SWOG's recruitment and retention committee has a focus on diversity in SWOG trials, in addition to a general trial recruitment and retention uh, priority. Dr. Kabanhol is the chair of this committee. Our patient advocates represent the patient voice at research committee meetings and trial development, and we are very appreciative of their contributions in all stages of the trial life cycle. The third support committee, the Oncology Re Research Professionals, or ORP, that committee liaisons with and provides impact, input and feedback on study procedures and administration of the study at the practice level. Note that there is one, there is currently one liaison position at open for the prevention and epidemiology committee, should any of you be interested. We also recognize Dr. Parker, SWOG's program officer at the NCI Division of Cancer Prevention for his guidance and for his support and guidance. SWOG NCOR also receives support for, from so many others at the Division of Cancer Prevention and Cancer Care Delivery, such as Dr. McCaskill Stevens, Dr. Geiger, Kate Castro, and Marge Good, to name just a few. We've seen the who, we've seen the who of the SWOG, in, the SWOG research base, so let's just have a quick look at the SWOG NCOR trial portfolio, where there are opportunities for you and your patients to be involved. Please take note in the participating in the participating sites column and notice that, that most of these trials are open to all sites with only two trials limited to NCOR sites only. You'll hear more about these trials in the presentations today and we encourage you to attend committee meetings uh, over the next few days. Be on the look for more ways to participate as three new trials will soon be activating. In addition, we are able to fully accrue to two trials in the past year with your help. And with this, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Hirschman is SWOG's NCOR Vice Chair. She will present on the SWOG NCOR Research Base Progress and Opportunities. So welcome to Chicago. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's great to be here in person and to see so many people here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing, what we've done, and a little bit about um, what's to come. So just to reiterate what we just uh, sort of went through, our, you know, it's, it's important to understand we use the term NCOR both as our research base, uh, meaning the research that we do that is population science, as well as all the different sites out there that are accruing um, to, to the studies. And so the research base's mission is really to, to design, activate, and complete scientifically important and clinically meaningful studies in cancer prevention, cancer control, and cancer care delivery. And these studies are open you know, some of them are open at NCOR and lab sites and individual sites, and some of them are only available to NCOR sites. Um, but what is unique about the NCOR sites uh, is that you represent the patients that we see every day in terms of who's who's treated. And so it's important for you and for us to participate in research collaboratively uh, so that we make sure that we're asking questions that are meaningful to the communities and to the patients uh, that, uh, um, that have cancer. So just to give you a sense of our overall organization, um, our research base leadership is myself, Dr. Blanke, Dr. Tangen from STATS, 
We have two executive officers uh, up until this meeting, Dr. Crew and Lyman, and as you just heard, Virginia's son will be placed, replacing uh, Dr. Uh, Lyman following this meeting. We have our Cancer Prevention and Epidemiology Committee, our Cancer Care Delivery Committee, and we have three Cancer Control Committees. Uh, they uh, have uh, symptom management, survivorship, and palliative care and end of life. Now, there is some overlap between these disciplines, uh, but the idea is that we have experts in those areas that can help guide the development of, uh, of these studies. So just to give you just to give you a little bit of um, uh, why we do what we do, I, I think you know we have to um, uh, celebrate our successes. And when we think of over the past five years or so, um, over 7,600 patients have been accrued to NCOR trials. Um, we've had multiple ideas that have been through the various different committees and and reviewed at triage, 29, eight, ten, over 10 have been activated. Most of them uh, are actually complicated and they require funding, not just the funding that we get from our NCOR grant, but also additional funds to help support the interventions uh, and the various um, activities of the study. And so multiple grants have been uh, submitted and funded. Um, our research has resulted in uh, 188 manuscripts and 111 abstracts. So every time you put a patient on the study, it contributes to that uh, success. So one of the things that's new, I guess the formatting is a little off on these slides, but one of the things that's new um, uh, this time around in the NCORE is that we have um, what we call our PRO core. And uh, as you all know, patient reported outcomes have uh, uh, garnished more and more acceptance and um, recognition of their importance, not just in the NCOR trials that are uh, cancer control oriented for primary outcomes, but also amongst uh, NCTN trials in terms of really understanding the adverse events and experiences of the patients on the different drugs, because understanding that helps us figure out what the best treatments are for our patients so that we can help them with informed decision making. So the goal of this PRO core is to ensure that there's rigor in the PROs that are selected and that there's guidance and we have standardization um, from trial to trial, that there's consistency. Um, and then these, all of the measures that we collect on our patients are not just used for that trial, they're, they're used for many secondary analyses, which I'll discuss in a second, and they give us a lot of in, information about the experiences um, and tolerability of the treatments um, that we're assessing. So to give you an example of, you know, how some of this data that we collect is used, in addition to our PRO core, we also have a large program in secondary database analyses. And a lot of this is the work of Joe Unger, who you'll hear about in a second, but this gives you a sense of just some of the trials that have recently, or analyses that have been recently published that really shed light on the experiences of patients. And we can take data from multiple different trials to be able to understand toxicities and experiences and side effects in ways that we couldn't just looking at one individual trial. So when you're, you're out there and you're asking your patients to fill all out, out all of these questionnaires, it's, it's important for them to realize the importance of it because um, ultimately it helps patients with decision making but it also serves as a basis for us to understand really important things like, um, you know, just to highlight one of them is, you know, that there are uh, differences by gender in toxicities. And the only way, especially the immunotherapy toxicities, and the only way we can know that is by looking at a, a lot of different trials uh, merged together. So just in terms of a little bit of success, these are studies that were published in the past year or so. Um, 
this is a study that was done looking at osteonecrosis. You can see that uh, the study accrued uh, several 3,400 patients. Uh, we were able to identify what the cumulative incidence was of osteonecrosis, but also to help guide what risk factors uh, there are for the development of this toxicity. Uh, this is a study we did looking at medication adherence, and we randomized uh, um, close to 1,000 patients looking at a text messaging intervention. We found that the text messaging intervention was of, really didn't help with medication adher adherence, but that non-adherence was really very common in both groups. Uh, it helped us learn that uh, we need to do more than just passive texting, but we were able to take this data and build a model so that we could really understand what risk factors um, contributed to non-adherence to endocrine therapy. And if you have multiple risk factors, you may have a rate of close to 50% of being non-adherent to therapy, which helps us determine who should enroll in trials going forward. Uh, this is a study I'm not going to really talk about because you're going to hear about it more in a bit, but this was our first pragmatic trial uh, to help us figure out about use of guideline informed therapy as a standard order entry uh, and whether or not that influences uh, prescribing patterns and outcomes. Dr. Ramsey is going to give a whole talk on this, but we were able to do this pragmatic trial randomized by site. Uh, modify the EMR and import and uh, as a result, we have uh, important outcomes that were uh, found from this trial. Financial toxicity is uh, super important. We hear about it a lot. A lot of the experts in the field of financial toxicity are, are in SWOG and leading uh, committees and trials in SWOG. This was the first prospective uh, cancer care delivery uh, trial assessing financial toxicity. And we found that uh, based on uh, what we call uh, financial uh, hardship, uh, or material financial hardship that the cumulative incidence is close to 75% uh, in 12 months about, uh, amongst uh, patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. And you can see how that divides down, but uh, these kinds of trials looking at patients prospectively gives us a lot of insight uh, into uh, what that financial toxicity consists of. Uh, this is a study by Virginia Sun. She came in as a junior investigator, was able to get an R21 grant. Uh, this study uh, closed to accrual this past year. Um, and, you know, looking at a really important area in terms of patients that undergo, that have rectal cancer in terms of bowel dysfunction, and looking at an intervention aimed at coaching and diet, um, and uh, versus usual care to see if they could control the um, symptoms that these patients suffer from. This is an understudied area, a study you can only do in a group like ours, um, and uh, hopefully this data will be reported out within the next year. Uh, this is another study that uh, also opened and closed super fast, thanks to all of you. Uh, a study that's going to help us understand a little bit more about um, peripheral neuropathy, one of the most common and devastating side effects, I think, of, of so many chemotherapy drugs that we give. Um, this study enrolled 1,300 patients in less than two years. Uh, it serves as a huge repository for us. Um, this, some of the results have been presented at ASCO uh, this past year and will be presented uh, at San Antonio Breast Conference uh, in December. But just to give you an idea, just looking at baseline, huge differences at, in baseline in terms of how the physicians reported patients' baseline symptoms versus how patients reported their own symptoms based on PRO, CT, CAE. Really two equivalent measures in many ways, um, but before we even start treatment and really showing the importance of, of asking patients about their own symptoms as opposed to relying on us to report what the, the patient's symptoms have. What's super exciting about this study is that these investigators, after doing this trial, were able to 
uh, get an R01. Well, at least it scored sixth, sixth percentile. So hopefully they'll they'll get their notice of award pretty soon. Um, really to interrogate the biology of the samples that were collected to really provide insights so that we can better you know, predict who's at highest risk for getting this. So if we have two potentially equal options, we may choose something less neurotoxic, but it also opens the door for drug development to try to think of ways to maybe prevent this uh, side effect of treatment. In terms of ongoing trials, there are many trials you can still open and accrue to. This is uh, 1904, which is looking at prevention. We know that hormonal therapies can reduce the risk of breast cancer in patients that are high risk. Yet despite that, many, many patients that are high risk don't take them or don't even know about it. And this study is um, a study looking at patient and provider level intervention. It's 50% accrued. So we're getting there. So if any of you have this open, uh, please continue to uh, accrue to it. Uh, this is a study that uh, is also in the prevention committee looking at, uh, you know, uh, ways of preventing colorectal cancer uh, in patients that um, have a history or have adenomas. And this study is so important uh, looking at these different interventions, uh, but we're almost there. 87% accrued. If every site that had this study open put two or three patients on in the next six months, we would be close to finishing this really important trial. Um, so uh, if you have it open, please continue to accrue. Uh, this is a study, uh, important nutrition-based study, looking at ways of using diet and nutrition to reduce inflammation, improve the immune uh, environment in the bladder, uh, to see if it actually changes, can change the um, pathology amongst patients that are um, undergoing a cystectomy for RCC. And so uh, this is a study that uh, randomizes patients to uh, an immune enhanced nutrition intervention. Um, the sites, your sites have been amazing at accruing. Uh, the study had some delays every time we needed more uh, or a change to the, uh, the, the drink, um, but um, it sounds like it's back on track. It's three quarters of the way accrued. Uh, it can be, uh, patients can uh, go on this study, it's open now. Uh, so if you if you had it open, please uh, consider re um, uh, uh, screening patients for this study. Similar to the CIPN study, this is a study uh, looking at the second most commonly discussed toxicity from the treatments we give, which is related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we know IRAEs are extremely common. They're unpredictable uh, and uh, probably make us very nervous when we're, we're giving these agents that we're gonna miss something. Uh, this is a study that um, open fairly recently, I check it. It's a prospective cohort study with a lot of biologic samples built into it to, again, uh, better be able to predict the toxicities uh, 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 that patients develop. Ultimately, we hope to be able to develop a risk prediction model uh, so that you can figure out who uh, may or may not um, be at risk for toxicities, maybe monitor them more. Uh, the study has, um, about close to 500 patients accrued in a relatively short period of time. It's between 20 and 25% of the patients have been accrued. Um, and uh, lots of people interested in looking at um, various different biomarkers for the development of this toxicity. So uh, we really appreciate the, the rapidity of which this is accruing uh, and continue to accrue. Uh, this is a huge success story coming um, also out of our prevention epidemiology committee looking at seeing whether or not we can use uh, this biomarker microRNA 371 to uh, help us with the management and predicting outcomes of patients with germ cell tumors. This study uh, has accrued extremely rapidly. Um, despite the fact that testicular cancer is a rare 
uh, rare cancer. And a lot of it comes from networking and communication and using all of the, the um, uh, uh, social media and partnering with all of the other groups uh, to get this study done. This is accrued extremely rapidly. It's about 60% accrued. It resulted in a junior investigator getting an R37 award. So it a um, lot of science will come out of this. Uh, it also um, uh, will, will help us define the way uh, testicular cancer can be treated going forward. Um, this is a study, a uh, follow-up study that to the uh, financial toxicity uh, cancer control delivery, uh, cancer care delivery study that was done as a prospective study. Uh, to follow up on that is an intervention trial to see whether or not um, uh, a financial navigation program can reduce financial toxicity. Uh, knowing that we have financial toxicity is only half the battle. The, the real battle comes in terms of figuring out how we can mitigate it for our patients. This is a, a trial that is all done remotely in terms of financial navigation. It involves patients and caregivers. It's been challenging to find partners that want to enroll in a trial together. A lot of modifications have been made to this trial to make it simpler to accrue. So if you had it open in the past and had a hard time, please reconsider it because a lot of the new modifications should make it simpler. We've put many patients on at our institution. Uh, once you find the right patients, uh, it's relatively easy uh, and it's, uh, it's really important um, for uh, uh, patients and the patient survivors, uh, you know, that, that they're partnered with. Uh, this is a trial that is also um, lagging a little bit in accrual. Uh, we'll probably, based on what we have, be able to reduce the number of patients that uh, we need for the study. Um, but it's a really simple study to, to open and accrue to and uh, follow patients on. I have many of my patients on this study. And it's really looking at ways that we can de-escalate some of the scanning that we do for our patients. We, we have patients with metastatic breast cancer that are getting scanned every three months like they were done in clinical trials. And when you ask practitioners, they don't know whether they should be doing it that often or less often, especially in patients that have normalized their tumor markers. So this is really asking a very simple question. Can you just follow the tumor markers instead of having to get scans every three to four months. Um, so if you don't have this study open, really you should look at it. It's very easy um, and really can help guide us in terms of care delivery. Uh, this is another study that's uh, looking at ways of pre preventing um, some of the cardiac toxicities that are associated with, um, uh, with uh, some of the chemotherapy that we give, particularly the, the HER2 positive uh, treatments we give for a long time. Uh, and so this study uh, is looking at whether or not carvedilol can prevent that cardiac toxicity. Um, it's uh, uh, really anybody in the metastatic pa cancer patient population that is high risk and is planned to get some type of HER2 targeted therapy. And it randomizes patients to carvedilol uh, versus usual care. Um, the tricky thing with this study is that you have to have an echo that gets registered and the data has to be uploaded. Um, but other than that, um, uh, it's about a third done. So if we can, you know, if now that we're giving more and more HER2 targeted therapy for longer periods of time, I think if you're having any challenges accruing to this, please let the investigator know. Um, but it's answering a really important question. Now there's some new studies that are, are just on the docket for opening that we're really excited about. Uh, this is a study uh, from Cancer Care Delivery that is evaluating the role of, um, uh, it's looking at precision medicine and evaluating the role of um, genomic tumor boards. We know that in some large academic medical centers, there are genomic tumor boards that help people interpret, you know, some of the results of the different, um, you know, 
the multiple different tests that are being sent for genomic evol evaluation of patients' cancers. This is, you know, looking at in the community where you don't maybe have access to all of that, whether these um, uh, enhanced genomic tumor boards actually help uh, inform the, the care that the patients are getting, uh, looking at whether or not um, uh, patients are getting genomically informed treatment, uh, treat, treatment off protocol, or not getting treatment that could benefit them. So uh, we're all uh, really excited um, about this study. Uh, it includes 18 different NCORE sites, all of which have um, already been um, uh, selected. This is a, a study uh, that's being run by myself and Lynn Henry. Um, that is uh, RO1 funded that really pivots off of a lot of the work that we've done in SWOG, looking and, and others have done, trying to figure out how to improve adherence to hormonal therapy. And we know that a lot of the reasons why patients are non-adherent have to do with side effects and side effects that may not be managed uh, in the short term because patients don't come in very frequently. So this study uh, is should be uh, activated in the next, I don't know, three, four months, hopefully. Um, and it's looking at whether or not active symptom monitoring, so um, patients that report their symptoms through PROs, through their phone, uh, and um, providing feedback in terms of when they start to develop symptoms. If if measuring and treating those symptoms earlier in the process helps keep those patients on uh, their treatment longer. And then this is a study also looking at the symptom of neuropathy, building on the work that we've done already and others have done looking at toxicities related to our treatment. Uh, this is being run by Melissa Accardino in collaboration with Dr. Pennington from NRG, looking at a cooling device that is provides both cooling to the hands and feet and compression in order to prevent uh, the neuropathy that patients get um, from taxanes or, or platinum-based treatment. Uh, so again, this study should be activated in the next uh, few months. Uh, and finally, uh, this is um, a trial that uh, uh, is being run by uh, Dr. Sun and Dr. Raz, looking at ways of improving lung cancer patients' outcomes before they go to surgery. And so it's, an inter, it's a perioperative physical activity intervention prior to patients going for their uh, cancer-directed surgery. Uh, it's a study that was funded by um, uh, PCORI and is currently going through the process of, uh, of evaluation at the NCI. So all of this work uh, wouldn't be possible if we didn't have funding both from the NCI, but also from the HOPE Foundation. Many of the investigators that are leading these trials have done pilot work or other studies that they've received funding for from the HOPE Foundation. And it's a critical component of our mission uh, to, um, uh, to be able to support these trials with philanthropy. So this is a plug. Uh, to, uh, if you're considering, please donate to the Hope Foundation because it has a huge, huge impact on our patients' lives and also uh, on our investigators being able to do these studies. So ultimately, the goal of the NCOR is to design and conduct and complete these trials. And you're out there seeing patients, and it's so important that if you notice problems with our trials or if you have ideas, I always say that every idea I've ever had has come from seeing patients and taking care of patients. And so if you have good ideas for studies, but you don't know how to do it, let us know, and we will maybe connect you with somebody with a little more research experience, and you can do it as a team. So don't hesitate to come to us with all of your ideas um, and suggestions, both for making the studies that we're doing better, but also uh, for new ideas of studies. And with that, I will end. All right, any questions from the audience? Dr. Berenberg? Uh, I have one question. Uh, one thing that comes out in the study is how the workload of the information that we have. 
Right. Well, it's it's a great it's a great point. So you know we're always in this. We're asking sites whether or not they're interested based on a concept, and then the study completely changes by the time they see the protocol. And we hear that a lot, like because you know so much happens back and forth in terms of design and what started out as maybe being a study that you could accrue to then becomes something that all of a sudden all of those changes make it challenging, and so. Um, we are trying to work through processes so that we're getting more feedback from community sites during the, the time between concept and protocol um, so that we can make sure that um, the, the studies may remain relevant and doable, um, if that's the question. Hi, Melissa Faust from Upstate Carolina NCOR. I have a um, request related to particularly cancer control trials, um, <clears throat> and that is the timing of the follow-up, which for SWOG trials seems to be from registration. And so if you get a patient that's a year or two or three years out, it is really difficult to get that patient within that window because the visit doesn't go off of the last visit. It goes all the way back to registration. And just as an example, S1714, um, where the two year and three year time point were added on, um, we, we're we actually in the midst of um, a very large conversation with our research compliance department because we've turned in so many protocol deviations related to that and you know because of how patients need to be seen following their cancer diagnosis and their treatment it's just not feasible to bring them in just so that the doctor can decide whether they're having you know what's what's their burden of peripheral neuropathy so you know, I don't know if I know for be well, they changed the follow up because of the so similar situation. They changed it to the timing off the last visit or potentially even easier would be if you could widen the windows from the 28 days. I, I, it's an excellent suggestion. And I think for the purposes of the way we analyze data, widening those windows is a really good suggestion so that we can we can. Um, uh, make it so that you don't get as many pro protocol diet, uh, deviations because that that is probably for those one and two year endpoints having wider windows um, probably doesn't matter as much analytically. So that's a great suggestion. I would say one of the other things that we need to think more about is how we can collect this information remotely. And so we are working very hard in terms of like EPROs and other modalities where we can try to figure out how to make, if we can't get a patient in, can we get 80% of the information remotely? So trying to figure out how to do that when we can um, is also something that's high on our priority list. So we would have no problem getting patient information remotely because we'll call the patient, we'll text the patient. A lot of our patients don't like to do electronic pros. The problem becomes the part that the physician, for which the physician is responsible, because our physicians are not going to make a telehealth visit to complete that questionnaire because who's going to pay for that time and et cetera, et cetera. So I love the remote completion and you know, we've talked about this ad nauseum in my site, but um, what I think we're going to do is we're going to ask the patient about their neuropathy and then we'll go directly to the investigator to decide on the attribution because we're in big trouble with research compliance, just to be frank. So how, is it because they're lot and I guess the question is how strict is it that the patients, you know, come up? Can they, you know, can their clinic visits be more in line with the 
to fit into that window, like if, if they're coming in at one one year. Well, the thing is, is come in at, 11 months or at our site, and, I'm, and I can only speak for our site because it's the only cancer center I've ever worked at. But once the patient's completed treatment, they're generally seen every three months for a period of time, and then they're seen every six months for a period of time, and then every year. And because of the timing base, being based off of registration, once they're off one time for a visit, when it gets to be the 28 and 52 weeks, they're always going to be off. Mm -hmm. And our providers, you know, they're trying to follow the standards of, you know, cl clinical practice and, you know, how often the insurance will pay for them to come in, et cetera. Now, what we do is we hope that a sick visit will happen and we'll run up and see the patient. But anyway, I, I just, I know that the, um, there's some some great uh, cancer control protocols that are getting ready to open that I know will want to participate right. in, but I cannot go through this again. And this is my director, and she cannot either. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, there's a lot of variability of when that one year visit is. Just you know, from a clinical practice standpoint, you know, for those follow up visits, um, but we can definitely go back and look at the trials and see if we can make some of those follow ups those long-term follow-ups be, you know, a year after they completed their treatment, you know, or, or something like that um, in some way, but, uh, or, or just have wider windows. Uh, there was one comment um, from the uh, virtual attendees um, from Mandy Baker. Yes, having time points based off both treatment and registration makes capturing, vi capturing visits within window difficult. So I think that's the same. I think that. that's yeah, the same we question spoke to that. Yeah. So, okay. So if that's a common question, then we do need to figure out how to deal with it. And it may be related to widening those windows may be the best way. Okay. Any, any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Hirschman. So now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Unger. Uh, our SWO, SWOG Pro Core Lead and Vice Chair of the SWOG NCORE at the Statistics and Data Management Center in his presentation on the use of patient reported outcomes in SWOG trials, past, present, and future. And following his presentation, we'll have a, a panel. Uh, thank you, Monica. It's good to be back. I, uh, this is my first in-person presentation in two and a half years, so. <laughs> um, the last time I gave one, everybody was had one foot out the door running for their for home uh, as the pandemic was launching. So uh, I assume that wasn't the material, but it's possible. Um, anyway, I <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that um, I know everybody tends to think of Seattle as this sort of wooded wonderland, and and it is. Um, this is another excuse to show a picture of my kids. But um, it also is a problem that we have a lot of fires lately. You can see this uh, image of the uh, red dots showing um, air quality index indicators, which we just got a <laughs> five minutes ago, just got another email from, from our institution saying that you can smell the smoke inside your offices, inside our building because of the forest fires. It gives beautiful sunrises, but they're kind of apocalyptic. Um, in contrast, here in Chicago, the air is wonderful, as you can see by that green. I never realized I'd have to come to Chicago for fresh air, but here we are. So I'm gonna um, talk about a lot of different topics as they pertain to uh, patient-reported outcomes. Uh, here's just a brief <clears throat> um, outline. I'm gonna talk about design and analysis principles, um, how we administer the many studies, what the current status is. I wanna give an example of a trial that has been completed uh, to show, uh, really basically to show everybody the, um, you know, the results of all the contributions uh, that all the sites, whether that be NCTN or NCORE sites, have put uh, towards patient reported outcomes and how meaningful they are. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about risk prediction, with, which uh, Dr. Hirschman mentioned in brief, and also um, a little bit about electronic uh, PROs. 
So we have a set of a guiding design and analysis principles that um, under, underpin um, the, um, the administration of PROs in our trials. First and foremost, we, we um, expect that there be a hypothesis-driven research question. We also expect that, there, that, the, um, that validated PRO instruments be used. Validation is a very uh, meticulous process that basically boils down to making sure that the instrument that you're using measures the thing you think you're measuring, and that's critically important. We expect that the um, administration of PROs be feasible um, in the context of the trial's main objectives. Uh, feasibility, for instance, was just raised as a point uh, in terms of windows and timing when somebody goes off schedule. Um, it's important for design, um, re relative to your question, and it is an important question that we think about a lot. Uh, I'm going to digress for a second if I could because I wanted to get up and respond. Um, it's really important that we maintain consistent assessment times across all the patients. However, we recognize that some patients get off schedule, so we try to allow for alternative ways for PRO administration, whether that be by telephone, uh, by email, uh, by include broadening the windows of administration and increasingly electronic patient reported outcomes. So these are things that we do think about and um, happy to think about them more if it's becoming a real issue. Um, we do try to minimize the burden on patients and sites. PROs are generally assumed to take, you know, hopefully take 15 to 20 minutes for each patient. That's been kind of identified in the literature as being really optimal. If it becomes too burdensome for patients, they're likely, more likely anyway, to just say, forget it, I, I'm too busy. And then you end up with really important issues around interpretation because you have a lot of missing data. So that is another issue. And then, and that uh, can also induce bias, and and so we we spend a lot of time thinking about a biased assessment. These um, design principles actually they all fit together into a nice uh, sort of a symmetric pattern. They are interrelated each with each other. They can induce either a virtuous or a negative cycle depending on the study design. As just one example, if you have hypothesis-driven research questions this will tend to limit patient burden because you know what you're asking about and it enhances feasibility on the other hand if it's if a hypothesis driven research question is absent um, the administration of the pros may be more cumbersome more difficult to interpret and uh, probably more burdensome for patients and sites due to excessive assessment interestingly when uh, this is from a paper that we put out um, to sort of highlight our strategies in general. And one of the reviewers said, um, uh, what's wrong with your figure? Everything points to everything. And of course, my response was, well, that's the point. Everything is related to everything. Anyway, I was more diplomatic than that, but. <clears throat> we, we now have, as Don mentioned, we have a PRO core. Um, uh, uh, comprised of uh, many of us, as you can see there at the bottom. Um, and the idea is to review each, especially NCTN related PRO substudy, but also, you know, we have PRO instruments on most of our NCORE trials. And so we are increasingly reviewing those as well, not to adhere necessarily to all of the strictures that I outlined, because there tend to be a lot more uh, PRO instruments on NCORE studies, but nonetheless to try to consider everything that are going to our guiding principles. So it's not just NCTN anymore, it's also our NCORE studies. Um, but we try to review for scientific content, feasibility, design, resources, and also try to push folks towards common instruments, whether that be the promise or the fact-based instruments, <clears throat> unless there's a rationale for a different, um, uh, a different uh, a instrument paradigm. This is our current uh, uh, set of, uh, of studies. <laughs> these are PRO substudies to NCTN trials. So this is not just the NCORE side. These are just the substudies to NCTN trials. So Don, you highlighted 22 studies, it's now up to 31. Um, and uh, 
course, the person who has all of these in her head is Rhea. And so she, you know, whenever we have a meeting weekly and she mentions a study, my common response is, now, which one is that? And, and she has all the answers in her head um, because she keeps track of all this stuff for us, thank goodness. But uh, as you can see, it's, it's quite a substantial list at this point. And much more, to be honest, um, and maybe a, a point worth mentioning, Don, when you have a chance to get up here on the panel, um, much more than we were um, thought we were funded for under our core grant initially. Um, so we're, we're trying to stay on top of it as best we can with somewhat limited resources. I want to um, mention that one of the positive trials um, uh, that was that's uh, going to be published here in JAMA Oncology here very soon. Uh, it's a quality of life uh, substudy to S1404, which is a, a trial of adjuvant pembrolizumab um, uh, compared to uh, high dose interferon or ipilimumab in, high, in patients with um, resected melanoma. As you can see, um, it, it's, it's actually, it actually takes more time to corral all the authors to do what they're supposed to do, all the co-authors, than it actually does to analyze the study. It's just a, a point of, uh, so if you're interested in being a, a quality life PI, um, just be uh, aware of that issue. So 1404 was an intergroup randomized phase three trial that examined again, whether adjuvant pembrolizumab improved clinical outcomes compared to standard of care with um, physician or patient choice of adjuvant ipilimumab or high dose interferon. And it showed that patients treated with pembro had statistically significantly longer relapse-free survival with a 23% reduction in risk of relapse. So we examined quality life outcomes by arm um, to uh, further address uh, the, the patient experience. The study was conducted at 211 community and academic sites. Um, it required uh, patients with stage 3A through 4 melanoma of non-ocular origin who'd undergone um, complete surgical resection of their primary patients must not have had prior immunotherapy and those who were able to complete questionnaires in English, Spanish, or French were required to participate in the quality of life assessment. We assess patients um, uh, at baseline as well as at regular intervals up to and including um, uh, th through protocol discontinuation and, and a recurrence. Uh, we used the FACT biologic response modifiers um, trial outcome index was the primary endpoint, which is comprised of the FACT physical well-being and functional well-being um, domains, as well as the BRM physical and the BRM uh, cognitive emotional subscales. The primary endpoint was at cycle three, which was um, uh, deemed at the design phase as being the assessment time that would uh, adequately reflect the cumulative incidence, uh, excuse, excuse me, cumulative impact of treatment while also minimizing potential differences in attrition. <clears throat> and that, that, by the way, is, a, is the kind of the consideration that we try to uh, target when we're figuring out what would be the time point uh, for the primary assessment of a PRO um, or quality of life um, assessment. That is to say, which which doesn't go, which assessment time actually can differentiate between arms potentially, but isn't so far out in follow up that you have these issue of attrition, potentially differential attrition between arms. We had 94% uh, power to detect a five point difference, uh, which was deemed uh, minimally important uh, based on the literature, and we use linear regression and linear mixed models. <clears throat> Um, as it turned out, we had 832 patients who were uh, analyzable uh, for this assessment. Um, now, this study had a bit of a different design and is probably not something we tend to do, which is that you, we only examined patients up through up to progression. Um, and because, as it turned out, the, uh, the arms had very different patterns of progression and recurrence, you ended up with very different patterns of um, of a response to the quality of life outcomes, which is can be problematic for interpretation. It actually is it's a valid, but it answers a narrower question about what's the patient experience while they're on uh, protocol treatment, not what is the patient experience overall. However, the um, the, the the fact BRM TOI cycle three compliance fortunately did not differ by arm, and evaluable patients were predominantly less than sixty five years in male. 
And here's what we found. The adjusted cycle three FACT BRM uh, trial outcome index score was nine point six higher points higher, indicating better quality of life on the PEMBRO arm, which was uh, far exceeded the target difference of five points. There was a bit of a quadratic relationship between treatment and time, as you can see in that figure, but the differences by arm exceeded five points in favor of PEMBRO for each cycle through cycle nine. So this was the largest, the published adjuvant anti-PD-1 monotherapy study in melanoma to date, and it showed the quality of life endpoints for patients randomized to PEMBRO were superior of those uh, randomized to standard care. Um, and so taken together, the, the results of 1404 showed both better improved clinical benefit as well as quality of life outcomes. Very important finding and very meaningful, I think, and one of the novel aspects of this trial compared to others. Dr. Hirschman also mentioned that given our sizable database that includes now many studies with uh, PROs, we can um, stack these studies together, link them, and address uh, issues uh, related to secondary examinations. In particular, we become fascinated, I would say, by the idea of risk prediction using patient reported outcomes. This study, um, which was led by Dr. Henry, was an attempt to identify predictors of pain reduction in patients with um, aromatase inhibitor associated muscul musculoskeletal symptoms. We used data from three of our three of our trials that address this issue. And we found that a baseline PROs were associated with a two or more point reduction in BPI average pain, which is a meaningful reduction um, based on these different um, domains of PROs and that when you added these factors together so that if patients had all four of the factors as opposed to um, zero uh, or even perhaps one of the factors they had six times greater risk of pain reduction and you can see in that figure there's a kind of a the, the way that the uh, there's a dose response relationship as you go up the number of factors the increased risk of pain reduction um, as the number of factors goes up that risk goes up and that sort of dose response relationship is really important for understanding in observational studies that what you think is happening is actually um, happening and that, that's a valid observation. So you can see the, the very regular pattern there. Don actually mentioned this study as well. This was uh, uh, based on S1105. We attempted to identify factors related to non adherence, as Dr. Hirschman mentioned. And, um, we identified 14 independent baseline PRO scales, which were each associated with non-adherence. And when you added them, you put them in the bins, different groups of size four or so, you can see again, there's that regular dose response pattern as the number of uh, factors goes up, the risk of non-adherence goes up. So also another very important finding. And I, I would say just in general, the idea that um, PROs can help you predict a wide array of clinical endpoints and treatment endpoints is really, I think, really important to the research community. It's really, in some ways, in my view, um, perhaps even revolutionary, though perhaps I under overstate that, but it's really the patients are kind of predicting the future. They're telling you what's going to happen, even if they perhaps don't realize it explicitly. But you can, uh, you can derive that from their patient-reported outcomes. Um, because of that, um, uh, idea, we have folded patient reported outcomes into our risk prediction study. So we have two of them now, both of them Dr. Hirschman mentioned S1714, which is an attempt to predict the taxane and induce uh, peripheral neuropathy, and 2013 to predict um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor toxicity. So patient reported outcomes are, are a consideration for prediction in both of those studies. Those are built in. And I just want to finish by mentioning electronic patient reported outcome assessments. In 2013, we are piloting EPRO. Um, this is really SWOG's first effort to do so. And it is optional. We have intentionally left it optional for patients to choose whether or not to use paper or electronic. And as you can see, very few patients actually choose electronic, just 11% to date. Um, and looking at the data, there are demographic differences. Patients who choose electronic um, were more likely younger and white. 
And among those who were less than 65, they were less likely to have Medicaid insurance. So there is something structural and systematic about the way patients, uh, whether or not they choose to use electronic patient reported outcomes. In my view, this has, um, this has implications for how we use EPRO. I think at this point, it's important to realize that we want to avoid inducing, inducing disparities in participation in quality of life studies by maintaining both the electronic and the paper options. I really think that's critical because we don't wanna to start to exclude patients by requiring EPRO for our studies and no paper option. We don't want certain types of patients, certain groups of patients to decline to participate. So challenges and lesson, lessons learned. The uh, one, the use of EPR of PROs is nowadays ubiquitous in randomized trials. Just about all of them have it. We try to maintain adherence to guiding design analysis principles as much as possible. We do triage our proposals. We try to ensure we have the resources to do it. Pharma supported PRO studies seem to be increasing and the PRO database can serve as a vital resource for hypothesis generation. And just to end, this is a, a histogram of the number of um, studies with uh, PRO substudies just on the NCTN side over time. And as you can see, it's growing quite rapidly. So it is uh, quite a big uh, part of our portfolio now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. We'll now invite our panel presenters uh, for uh, our panel discussion, actually, for the pro group. So we have um, Allison Nair, who is uh, with us virtually today. She is a clinical research associate and nurse at St. Joseph Hospital in New Hampshire. We have Dr. Hirschman, as you uh, have met already. Uh, Matt Ng is one of our data coordinators at the Statistics and Data Management Center in Seattle. And uh, we have Rhea Vedia, the coordinating statistician of the ProCore, also from Seattle. Um, before we proceed, I just wanted to mention that we do have some sliders still available. There's plenty of food if anyone wants to go up to um, refresh themselves, because I think they'll be taking the food away pretty soon. So please help yourself with that. All right, so we have our members up. Would you like to start? And is Allison on the line and unmuted? I am. Oh, yay, she's here. Hi, Allison. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. So we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, ePro, right, Joe? Um, experience, challenges, or concerns? Sure, go ahead. I wasn't I sure driving? I was driving. I think you are. But I can start, maybe, yeah, okay. just to get things going. Um, so, uh, Dawn, uh, to you at the end of the table there. Uh, first, um, you, our figure that shows how many <laughs> substudies we have certainly does not was not anticipated in our core grant. What are your thoughts about what um, how we're anticipating, the, how we're thinking about this issue, considering it as we go into our next core grant cycle? Yeah, I think it really, I mean, it really reflects our evolution over time, right? So when I first started coming to SWAG and, you know, the last century, um, you, know, you know, people were very anti, you know, patient reported outcomes, very anti questionnaires that it would, it would somehow um, limit the patient's desire to go on the trials. And you know, I think that over time, we've really been able to show really the opposite and, you know, conveying the messages to patients like that, that this information really helps other patients make decisions down the line about how tolerable or toxic or that the treatments are, how much it affects their quality of life. And, you know, I think it helps a lot of patients feel engaged. And so, um, you know, we have really great data collection um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'd like to hear from other people in terms of whether or not they think it's, you know, we're doing too much or too little, but it's hard to imagine being able to evaluate two different treatment modalities in, in the current setting without having that, that data to report at the end, because we just know what we did in the past was really insufficient and resulted in us grossly underestimating the toxicities of many treatments. 
So that being said, we've also made a lot of progress in terms of how we collect that data and how you know we know a lot more about how to analyze it. And there is a lot more efficiency as a result. So it, it doesn't cost as much to put a few PROs in, in terms of the what we get back from it. Um, so I think that on from our side, we we really rely on the PRO core and that evaluation to figure out what are going to be the most meaningful questions down the line uh, that are going to help with decision making, because um, that's really how it's how I think it's used a lot in terms of toxicity, especially when the margin of benefit is small. And, you know, knowing that it's, I think, our priority as we start to think about the next grant cycle to make sure that we have sufficient resources to be able to, you know, include PROs in the NC, as many of the NCTN trials where the results are going to be meaningful. And, you know, the reality is they're being used not just in phase three trials, they have meaning in phase two trials. And even, you know, in phase one trials where we're trying to figure out the maximum tolerated dose, maybe we need the patient's information to know what's tolerable. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, what, what's, what lies ahead for us is figuring out the most efficient way to collect it. And while EPRO is so maybe a little bit foreign to patients now, I think that the technology is evolving and patient's acceptance of it is evolving. And maybe with a little more education and, and other things on our part to make patients feel more comfortable as the technology gets better, that will also save resources uh, for being able to, to, to do more of these studies. Yeah, I mean, EPRO is the, is the future. The question is how quickly are we gonna get there and what do we do in the meantime? Uh, but I, I completely agree. I, I want to actually ask uh, Ria if I if I could just just to pivot off of that point. Ria, I know you've had some thoughts about how we could um, um, make EPRO administration even easier for sites. Um, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that. Sure. So, uh, Jill, like you showed the slide for S2013, I mean, there is certainly not a lot of uptake for EPROs yet, and it's still newer. We're only using it in one SWOG studies. Maybe other groups are also using it in a few studies. So really, I think the question is, what do we need to do from like the patient perspective where we might make it more user friendly because right now I think we focus more on apps to collect EPROs. So maybe patients are more comfortable with something like a red cap link being emailed to them. Maybe that's more familiar to them because that's happening for other things. So that might be one option, just kind of relying on maybe email and a web survey rather than an app, which may be hard for patients. Um, just because you know you need to have the right phone and the right operating system and then everything needs to just work seamlessly and you need to figure out how to use a new app so some of those challenges are worth thinking about also from a site perspective if sites have to spend time teaching an app like just sort of how to download how to use this app to a patient is that taking away from time doing other things so just a few considerations and i mean also with um, the new trial we're doing for active symptom monitoring, we're going to be collecting data. If patients don't have a smartphone, we're, we're using text-based technology to get that data as well. So I think also recognizing that not everybody has great internet, not everybody has that type of the smartphones for apps, that if we're broader in how we collect that remote data, it also may help um, uh, uptake or familiarity for patients. I completely agree with that. I think the access to the technology can be a bit of a hindrance and induce disparities in response patterns. And I think we've already seen that. Um, I know the, um, P, uh, the NCI is actually reconsidering the EPRO um, a vendor at least. I, I wish there was, Lori Manasian was here to tell us exactly what's going on, but um, we're just trying to keep up with that. But I, I do think that these kinds of 
considerations for how electronic PRO capture can be more flexible going forward to be really critical. Um, and if, sorry, go ahead. I mean, just on that, you know, I work on another trial with EPROs. It, it could go the other direction too, in terms of like making sure that we have, you know, data collection is is complete, right? And so one of the things we feel confident about is that if we have the patient and they're in front of us and we give them that form and we're standing in front of them, we're gonna get that data. And the amount of time, energy and effort it takes on the back end when we electronically send it out and then we have to check to make sure it's done and do you send them another one and do you send the site's information, do you audit? Like we're at much greater potential for missing data as a result. And so we know from trials in general that rely just on electronic data capture that the missing data goes, does go up unless you create a whole infrastructure around it for auditing um, to make sure that when patients don't fill out everything or don't fill it out completely, that somebody's on them or on the sites to make sure that it's getting done. So what we think may be improving or reducing costs or improving access may have some other consequences that we need to pay attention to in real real time so allison a question for you is could you share a little bit of your experience with epro your, your site you've been very successful on 2013 and you also have experience on um, the regular uh, regular pros on 1714. I have. I, I joined a couple of years ago in S2017, uh, 1714, was all done at that time on paper. And it was during the pandemic. I was very lucky. We were as a hospital not to have many of our cancer patients experiencing the pandemic and getting sick at that time. So I was able to really collect all the data. However, in a small research hospital like ourselves, where there's only a 0.4 FTE, every minute counts. And the EPRO, as I, as I understand, the, I understand the, the problems that are inherent in it, I have had a wonderful success with it so far. And Matt, um, I realize that you speak with a lot of uh, clinical research coordinators and sites regarding EPRO. Could you please provide any kind of feedback you've received on some of the challenges that some of the sites have seen and why they don't participate? Yeah, um, so on S2013, we have a feasibility questionnaire, um, as um, Dr. Unger mentioned previously, where we're looking for feedback from the patients on their experience um, through the whole PRO um, from beginning to end. Um, and so for patients that are on EPRO, we ask um, a series of questions about their experience. And for those that are not, um, for those that are doing traditional paper-based PROs, we ask um, why they didn't choose EPRO. And um, based on those responses and some of the feedback that we got from sites, the number one reason seems to be that um, they're just not familiar with smartphones or mobile apps. Um, that seems to be really the biggest reason. And then um, secondly, um, they don't own a smartphone or tablet, so they don't have the capability to do that. So um, it, it's still very early on. Um, uh, the study just opened last year, so we don't have the full picture. Um, but it is still important. These points are important to consider as we start implementing EPRO in some of our future studies. There's also a comment in the chat. Thank you, Matt, um, from Judy Johnson uh, as an option as well. If study site coordinators have the time collecting pros when the patient visits clinic could help and also build rapport patient relationships too. So that's a really good point. Thank you, Judy. Do we have other questions from the chat, Monica? Or audience, <laughs> please feel free. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Claire. Um, 
One thing I see, I see a lot of patients do uh, in-person assessments versus electronic. And one thing I think about a lot when I administer these PROs is, you know, on the research side of things, this is a data point we're collecting, but to the patient, that's their life. And a handful of times, their responses are unremarkable, they're answering, they feel good, they're fine. But there are a lot of times also when patients report, you know, answering the mood questions or like physical pain questions, they're having a really hard time. And sometimes I just feel awful asking the question and just moving on and I engage with them. But I just wonder as a research coordinator, do we have like a duty to do anything else? Obviously with the clinician or oncologist, they might be already having these conversations, but sometimes I just feel like this is such a personal thing and we're the NCORP, we care about their experience. Should we be doing anything, you know, if they're scoring a certain number, should we have to then do something? Like if they're not already having a psych referral or doing something with their pain management, a lot of these things are psychosomatic. So I just wanna see how we can, you know, even care more for their experience. So I'm, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna defer to Dawn primarily because she's in the clinic, but I would say formally, I don't, to my knowledge, the responses on, on patient reported outcomes are not formally enfolded into sort of individual care guidance, but informally I could see how that might occur, Dawn. I mean, I think that's what separates collection of PROs for research purposes from active symptom monitoring, which is where you act on that change from baseline. And, you know, you know, I think that there are studies that we're doing where that's built into it to alert somebody if there's a big change. I think most IRBs require that if you're asking psychiatric questions that, you know, that if somebody reports that they're suicidal, for example, you have to have something in place to act on that in real time. I think um, a lot of the measures are domains, so you can't really tell how they're doing or how they're changing unless you calculate a score and look over time. So it's not, they're not really meant to be acted on. That being said, if you do notice something, you can always encourage the patient, you know, if you're, if you're having a hard time, you should discuss it with their with your provider because they may have some suggestions for you. So it's always, if it is something as a coordinator that you notice or if a patient expresses to you, you know, it's, it's a good idea to either, you know, not only to let the research team know, but also to empower the patient. If they haven't felt comfortable bringing it up, it may be something that they want to discuss with their provider. Um, any other questions? If, if not, I'll turn it back to you, Monica. Thank you very much. We appreciate um, the panel. If you have any other questions, be sure to contact us or send your uh, questions in chat if you're virtual or come speak to one of our panel presenters afterwards. Thank you very much. We'd love to introduce now Yvonne Lackey, um, who will come and speak with us on a very provocative title, A Walk on the Wild Side. Um, Yvonne is currently at the Pacific Cancer Research Consortium, NCOR, and she previously worked with the SWOG Statistics and Data Management in Seattle. I thought we might get a break before I ended up here. Oh, after me, great. In other words, talk fast. <laughs> Got it. All right, folks. So my boss says to me, what is it? Uh, buckle up, buttercup. Here we go. So thanks, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody in person like Joe. It's one of the first times to get up and, and do a presentation. And my gosh, how do I do I push this button? Uh, the green one. The green one. Yes. Thank you. All right. So I am the holder of the um, work at the Pacific PCRC NCOR. Just so you know, um, this is our the breadth and scope of the NCOR. We um, are as far north as Alaska, and we have sites down in, um, in the Los Angeles area as well, and all the way into Idaho. So we have about 45 sites that we're responsible for. But that isn't what this talk is about. Back in 2019, I stood in Chicago and I gave a presentation about what it was like to be at the statistical center and then moving to a site, because I'd been at the Stat Center for a really long time, really long time. So I've been at the site now for a while, and Monica said, would you like to come back and maybe do an update? And I'm like, sure, I'll do that. So this presentation is a little bit about um, going back and reflecting on the 2019 talk, as well as kind of 
the last few years, and then um, what we're up against right now. So that's why this is called a walk on the wild side, because hasn't it been? The last few years have been crazy, just absolutely crazy with some of the things that, that have happened in the world and the pandemic, and there's just lots of things. So um, this is my observations of pre and post pandemic world and what that looks like for research. So back in 2019, at my presentation, I, um, I was like, research. And at that time, just three years ago, it was like uh, research was in the background, right? People kind of knew about it. You know, they didn't really want to pull the curtain back, but they knew research happened. And so it was acknowledged, but not really understood. In 2019, my worries were that we had a very mobile society. There were a lot of expectations about the type of work and the kind of work that people would do. The salary requirements, turnover. Um, and we talked about how turnover makes me grumpy. And uh, now the, the turnover still kind of makes me grumpy, but I have a little bit more anxiety with that grumpiness as well. Um, and then all the training that we had to do, training, training, training all the time. From the, the provider perspective, I was really worried about new physician engagement. What did it look like in order to bring new physicians, new providers into um, research and getting them to understand the need for research um, at various, you know, whether it's a, within a research base or if it's through pharmaceutical or sponsored studies, but how important it was to continue the torch that so many before them have, have, um, have carried. And then I also worried about the value research brings to our hospitals and to our community, because a lot of times our hospitals, even in 2019, were really looking at the, at the dollar, the dollars that were being brought in, and research doesn't necessarily come with a lot of money attached to it. And in fact, for many institutions, it's, it's a loss leader. It's good for our patients, but it not, is not necessarily good for your, for your bottom line and for your budget, but it's still very important. So in 2019, um, from enrollments from NCORE sites, I, I tend to look at be kind of um, NCORE sites um, centric because that's where I'm I'm housed and I'm located. So in 2019, at the end of at the end of the year, we ended enrollments at 2,083. Um, and Monica asked me to say that um, let's be inclusive. So um, so NCORE studies from SWAG sites all sites was 2258 in 2019. So pretty good, pretty good enrollments, right? And then this happened, okay? <laughs> this happened. Now, who would have thought this would have happened, right? And um, I still like this one, but I add the letter C in front. It's now it's can't wait till Friday. I mean, I just feel like that every, every day, right? Um, so this happened. So while this was so as 2020 was starting, um, my institution had been in um, uh, negotiations with our union represented caregivers. And for six months prior to January, we had been gearing up for the possibility of a work stoppage. And, and so January for three days, they opted for a work stoppage. And I'm a research director for oncology. What do I know? I'm, I'm not patient facing. I just kind of push papers around. They said, you are going to be a wayfinder. So my job for four days was to make sure that the, we had a hospital to run. We had to bring in outside nurses. We had to bring in our environmental services. Anybody who was represented by the union needed, we needed to backfill. So I became a, a, a wayfinder for patients, a wayfinder for nurses who had, who had come in from um, Louisiana and New York and other places. We, had, we have a 16 block campus. So I had to help them find their way. Um, and it was a three day work stoppage and, and it really, it was, it was um, incredible in a lot of ways, but it was, um, uh, in the end, it was it was fine. It wasn't wasn't anything like you hear on the news all the time with really crazy things happening. It worked out. Everything was OK. So that was middle of January. And then by February, we started hearing about people getting sick and we and and Washington State, in particular, the Seattle area became the epicenter. It wasn't the cruise ships anymore. It was Washington State. We became ground zero. And um, I don't know. Um, I think New York was the next place. But we knew things were happening. Um, our hospital started seeing people, sick people coming in. 
Um, our governor on March 23rd issued a stay at home order. Our freeway system in Seattle is terrible. You can't get, I live 25 miles away. It takes me an hour and a half to get to work. It, I made it in 25 minutes um, because there was nobody left on the road. I was like, this is cool, you know? And, um, but yeah, again, they said, hey, Vaughn, you did such a great job being a wayfinder. Um, we are going to turn you into an entry control point person for our main hospital. Awesome. So I became a COVID screener. I became an enforcer. Um, I don't know how many of your hospitals share things with you, but I was, on, I was considered frontline at that time. Um, and there's this thing that young pe people like that I don't know much about, and it's called TikTok. And um, so we would have um, groups of four to six young people try to break through our control points to get to our units to be able to take pictures of the um, the people who were dying in the hospital and um, we got really good at being able to watch them and there were two of us in particular that she and i would say we go here they come and so we'd split and try to to make it to the so that they didn't make it to the elevators it was really hard we also became support for hospital staff who were day in and day out were just not doing well because they were frontline. I was not frontline. They were. They were watching these patients. They had nothing they could do. Um, and this gal that I worked with, I came, I was walking down the hall, I was on my way home, and um, she was curled up in a ball um, sitting on the side of a, a windowsill. She was just sobbing. And I asked her what was wrong. And she said, um, I'm 19 years old. I was hired as a Starbucks barista. And she says, I have, I have helped um, deliver babies in the roundabout in front of the hospital. I've had to hand, hand to people bags of clothing where their loved ones have died where they didn't get to say goodbye. And she said, and we still don't know. We still don't know, and I'm scared. And, and I gave her a hug against the rules, gave her a hug and said, we're in this together. We're gonna be okay. I'm in research. We are going to figure this out. And um, it was just um, an, an amazing thing and one of, one of, a very hard thing for me to do, to step out of that box, not be a nurse, not necessarily really appreciate being frontline for um, pay, uh, public, um, but I did it and so did she and, and we did make it through. My journey for our oncology program was also um, not quite as tense, but I, we also had to make decisions, right? Um, all but essential surgeries were halted um, across the board in Washington state by governor mandate. Um, we had no interventional radiology support, so we couldn't even do any of the, uh, the testing, the eligibility testing that's required for many of our studies. And then um, we had to create a research priority system whereby only the patients who had no other option were, would be able to be enrolled on a clinical trial. So this typically ended up in the phase one area where they'd gone through multiple other um, research um, protocols and other treatments, and, and this was sort of a last ditch for them. So we set up a panel to, for this uh, priority system to, to figure out, and we'd have to, for our support, we'd have to reach out, do we have interventional radiology? Do we have ability in a, um, for an inpatient bed? Do we, can we keep, make sure that this research patient stays safe? Um, and so we ended up um, with that priority system, but we had to halt most of the NCORE studies. The NCORE were starting to get the COVID studies on board, so we did participate in those, but there was a time when we just, we would quit, we just couldn't do it. Um, and then we had to pivot, right? It was a, it was a, um, a public health crisis. And so we stopped pursuing any of the studies that we were uh, already involved in, and we had to turn and pivot and do COVID. And so my team had to learn about, uh, again, all the things of the PPE, all the gear, the COVIDs, the, um, everything that, um, that they had put into, into place to keep COVID researchers safe, um, my team was doing as well. Um, and I'm you know, forever grateful for everything that they tried to do. For NCI, CTEP, DCP, we hear a lot of things about um, how our government institutions and our government structures don't ha ha really help us sometimes. They knocked it out of the park for us. So thank you for, to our colleagues. They went to work right away. They said, telehealth, you guys got it. Remote consent process, as long as you do it in conjunction with your, your informed consent process, way to go, let's do that. You wanna to need to lose your uh, current uh, local health care for continuity of care, let's do that. Shipment of oral agents, we're gonna work with that. 
Um, use of APPs, that's opened up a whole new opportunity for us as we're, as we're not seeing enough providers really to be able to see our, our, our patients. Spanish consent forms, they're still working out those things and giving us translations and, and different um, consent forms and things in other languages that are empowering us to do our jobs more. So I just, you know, shout out to Dr. Mooney and um, Dr. McCaskill-Stevens for even making this possible and for everything else back at um, NCI that, that you think of. So thank you. So 2020 enrollment. So um, again, we had 2,083 from Encore sites and 1,530 um, in, in 2020. So that's not too bad um, overall, concerning you know what was going on in the world. Um, and then from uh, SOG sites altogether to studies, it was 1,518. So um, not too bad. I call 2021 the blurred year because I know lots of things happened, but I just am having a hard time when I was putting this together. What really happened? So we had vaccines. We were still masking. We had a little bit of travel, but really not travel. Um, most were still working from home. We wanted on-site monitoring to come back. Please let it come back. Oh my gosh, please don't let it come back because there was just so many feelings about having people outside of your institution and outside of your bubble in, on site. Um, and yet it was really hard to get all those documents ready and pushed out electronically and have them available. Um, but I think the best part of 2021 was diversity, equity, and inclusion. The fact that it was finally being realized in clinical trials and across the world in every sort of um, um, uh, industry that we need to think more about uh, people who don't look like us. Um, and I'm saying, don't look like me. So we started um, implicit bias training in my institution. We had open forum discussions about what it was like to, um, to um, have English as your second language. For some of the, my employees, it's their third language. And what it's like to be, and, and the freedom and the flexibility to ask questions if you don't understand something, to be able to openly and honestly ask that question so you can better understand um, at my age, what it meant versus what somebody who's 22, what that means at, at his or her age for the same thing. Um, we uh, started OHETI, our Office of Health Diversity, um, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, we started a conversation about NCORE, the TMIS study. Uh, sorry, SWOG, TMIS, different group, um, different research base. But we started talking with them about how can we start engaging this, this group in the community to make that awareness of this TMIS study being around um, for um, 2D versus uh, tomosynthesis 3D mammograms. And so they were like on it. They were so excited, but we had to teach them what research was. And we had to teach them what it meant to be on a, on a trial before they could go out then and then talk to others and that they would feel comfortable um, with their constituency. They reached out to the um, one of the largest insurance companies in Washington State um, for underserved populations. And that insurance company said absolutely positively no. We will not allow any of our um, insured to participate on this, and and I pull, they have policies against it, and it's all and so this was very low level insurance company. We're working our way up, you know, to find out if we can still have that possibility. But it, it's I, I put ongoing discussion um, because if we cannot get our insurance carriers to understand that this would ultimately benefit them if we have the answers to some of these questions, why not let their people participate? So really excited um, that this awareness happened. So our 2021 enrollments, again, we're going up 1696. That's pretty good. Um, 2021, 2111 from all sites. Um, but these are from NCORN enrollment sites. So it looks like, you know, we're heading back up. We're, we're, doing pretty, we're doing pretty well. And then we find out that 2022 is said exactly like 2020. You know, it's just, it's just not OK, right? So another way to think about it is we got through 2020, we made it through 2021, and there's a sea monster in 2022, you know? So here we are, 2022. What does that sea monster look like? My enrollments are down. It's kind of a sea monster, right? From NCORE sites through the first six months, we've had 671 enrollments. Um, Monica took my paper. Um, <laughs> I think I dropped it. Um, 891 um, uh, from two, two NCORE studies, right? But 671. So what's contributing to that number, right? I think there's quite a few things that are contributing. 73 hospitals closed their doors by the end of 2021. 
Most of those are in community settings, rural community settings, which means they're gonna have a tougher and tougher time to even get any sort of care. Hospitals are losing money. Um, several lost uh, close to a billion dollars in the first six months, my hospital system being one of those. Um, revenue and reimbursement aren't keeping pace. We're having challenges in discharging patients. Um, in my institution, over 17% of the patients who could be discharged are not be, can't, because there's no skilled nursing facility to put them in, so we're housing those patients. And the more we have to house patients because there's nowhere to go, the less we can actually treat sick people, including our research patients, right? If they get sick, there's nowhere, there's, there's no bed. There's no way that we can care for them. It's really very concerning. Um, supply chain disruptions. Beginning of the year, we started out, we were missing the right kind of blood tubes. By June, we were um, struggling to find contrast media. Um, and then medications, fludarabine. Good luck finding fludarabine for your hematology patients. And last week I heard heparin flush. We had a three-day supply of heparin flush available for all of our cancer institute. And these aren't things that are going away. On the FDA's uh, shortage list, there's 35 medications that are much needed um, that are on the shortage list that they don't know when it's gonna end. And that is just hospital challenges, right? Workforce challenges are the ones I think that are hitting us the, the hardest. The great resignation, many people who put off resigning um, and now that the vaccine is available, they're saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm done, I'm, real, I'm, I'm done now. Um, they are, they're just resigning and they're, they're retiring. Um, poaching, I'm calling it poaching, pharmaceutical companies. We are really well trained in this research space and most of our institutions are, are nonprofit based. Those pharmaceutical companies, they want us. We are very well trained. We suit their needs. We know we know how to do this and we know how to do it well. Site to site, we're poaching from each other. Um, and we're getting in, in wage wars. Um, if you work for me, I can give you X amount, you know? So retention bonuses are, are, are bonuses for pulling somebody away from one to go to another is also really important um, or something that's happening. We have a lack of qualified candidates. There just aren't an, enough of us learning about research when they're in, in university, or even in high school. We talk about a lot of things, but we don't talk about research. How many of you actually in high school said, I wanna be a researcher? No, you don't, you don't. You, 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 you think about other things and you kind of fall into this really amazing career. And then um, before I said I was worried about physician engagement, now I worry that there's just not enough physicians and nurses to meet the growing demand. And this is where I'm hopeful because CTEP and NCI and DCP have said such a good job of thinking outside the box. Maybe they can help us think outside the box too about having people work at their highest scope and not their lowest scope. And they're doing that with APPs. Maybe there's other things that we can think about that they could approve that would ease our way as well. So what's worse? Have you guys, zombie candidates. Um, and this, the, who has time to be a zombie candidate? And what these people are doing is they're learning a lot about the, 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 um, the job and you call them for the interview and they knock it out of the park. And they're not even interested. They're just doing it to mess with your brain. And I know this because it hasn't happened to me, but one of the other directors for one of our other programs said, I have this really awesome candidate. She texts me back, she goes, zombie. I was like, oh my gosh, it does happen. It's just, I don't know how people have the time. All right, so where do we go from here? So we need to, for those of us that are left in the room and the left virtually listening to this, we need to acknowledge that stress and the burnout, right? It is happening, it's happening right in front of us. We need to make sure that we're encouraging self-care. Um, that, that any of us that are of an age where we are at an age where we can retire and we haven't or we're still here or we retire and we came back, um, we need to make sure that we have succession planning. There's, I think, a huge gap between people like me who have been in this, in this, working in this field now for a very long time um, to those that only have two or three years of experience. We've got to help to train them and mentor them into this amazing field. Um, and so and we need to have that succession planning because I want people to be way better than I am, right? It's my whole goal. Learn from me, but be better than I am. Be better at this job than I am. Um, so 
take advantage of the SWOG mentoring program. I put Christine's um, name on here, Phyllis. Um, it's not in the room, and Christine's in the back of the room. Uh, we're having a little bit of a changeover in our mentoring program, but uh, Donna Merrow used to be the person you would contact. She is retiring as of next month. Way to go, Donna. Um, and um, But if you want us to come to your site, if you're, if you're on site, we'll travel. We will join your all staff meetings. We will put together anything that you want us to talk about, um, SWAG forms, quality of life, windows, um, there are things, uh, statistics, we do a statistics course. And the thing is, we try to make it fun so people will go, yeah, this is why I'm doing this. I'm hurrying, Monica. So pandemic challenges and opportunities. Um, so morale, you're gonna have a lot of morale problems. We've had, had the same thing. We do a feel good Friday. Um, we highlight one staff member per week on a Friday. Um, it's just like a one page thing about who they are, what they do, why they do it. Um, we do Schwartz rounds quarterly. There was one last night. Um, and it was uh, about using um, interpreter services and um, the struggles that uh, non-English speaking patients have with care. They might sign a consent form in a, a short form or a consent form even if you have it translated in their language, but they don't know what to do when they start having um, adverse events and there's nobody around. That becomes hard for them. So what are the types of challenges that, that patients might have um, during their, the course of their care? Or maybe an extra question about that if we were able to do some of the quality of life in different languages. Um, we do a book club. We talk about what it's like to be an introvert in an extrovert's world. Um, we talk about what it's like to be a gender different, or, um, the LGBTQ um, population. Um, we just we do all kinds of things, and then we do outdoor events. We've done baseball games. We've gone to museums. We've gone to parks. We've done things in indiv uh, individual people's houses, but they've all been outside to make sure that people feel comfortable. Um, for staff retention, um, staff retention, um, we do we've done uh, revisions to our onboarding process. What are the things that you really liked? What are the things that made that were not so good that we need to approve upon? Um, we do open forum every other Friday. They can um, I hold a forum where they can come and they can ask me any question, and that might have to do with um, how the hospital is administered. Um, it, I oftentimes don't have the answers to that, but I know how to get the answers to, for their questions. Uh, we, when we hear somebody say, wow, gosh, I really messed up that, um, that SAE. I, I didn't do it quick enough. So we say, great, we're gonna teach everybody. If, you've, if you maybe had a problem with that, that means other people are as well. So we do lunch and learns, and they're not really lunchtime because nobody, so we try to you know, figure out the best times. Uh, institution has offered retention bonuses. Um, we do life work balance, not work life balance, life work, because life comes first for everybody, right? So we want to make sure that everybody is um, well as at work and well at home. And we allow people to have that flexibility to do what they need. And we have a hybrid work model. So if you're patient facing and you have a patient in that day, we expect you to come and take care of that patient. Um, if you, and then you can go home, if you can finish your work from home. Um, but we typically, um, we encourage people to be on site between one and three days. They don't have to be if they don't have any patients. If they're completely not patient facing, they're data facing, they don't have to come in. But we're finding more and pe more people are starting to come back into the office because we are a strong, small, tight-knit community. So where do we go from here from protocol development? Really look at eligibility. Look at your, um, when things are being developed, this is for, the, for those of you from the SDMC and the, and make sure before you turn out a protocol that it is really as close to being as perfect as it can because by the time, every time you do a new amendment, it, it costs us time and energy and effort. Um, and so we wanna make sure that everything that we need is there from the, how the protocol is developed to the forms design and continue what you're doing now for research awareness. SWAG's doing a really good job of that with the uh, plain language writer. And as well as I think Dr. Dyson just um, is equity and inclusion new committee. So I think SWAG is doing a good job at, at keeping that research awareness across all communities, which I really appreciate. So, I'm almost done. So life's most persistent urgent question is, what are you doing for others? I don't want any of you in the room or virtually ever to think in your job that you're not doing anything for anybody else. Maybe you only do look at that data. Maybe you, maybe you don't see that patient directly. Maybe you're a scheduler. But everything that you do matters. You are helping with respect. You're improving science. You're increasing knowledge. You are participating in clinical trials. You're helping people with choice. We are making groundbreaking, um, teaching and learning about groundbreaking decisions so that people like, like Joe um, can do the statistics behind 
we can, you know, figuring out what works for people in EPRO. We're finding out EPRO doesn't work for all populations. Who, who would have known had our patients and had we not been a part of that? So never, never, never let anybody say to you that you're not making a difference in somebody's life in research. And even if they don't participate on a research trial, you have changed their life too because of the research you have done. So even though a trial might be negative, it's one, it's okay, because that means that wasn't a good option for the rest of the population. The next trial might be. So never, ever, ever think that you're not contributing. And with that, happy Wednesday. <laughs>
which can be sent to patients via email or text message or an automated voice system. The system will then alert a site that a patient's side effects have reached a certain severity threshold and require follow-up by a provider. A studies hoping to show that if medical providers address patient symptoms quickly, within days versus weeks, then patients will stay on endocrine therapy longer. If you're interested in participating in this study, please reach out to us or Dr. Lynn Henry and Dr. Hirschman. Thanks, Kim. I'm Roxanne Tapasho, and I began with SWOG in 2005 and later moved on to SELECT, the Selenium and Vitamin E Cancer Prevention Trial. I now work on SWOG and core trials in prevention and cancer control. Sam and I share data management of S1501, which is under the Cancer Survivorship Committee. This study asks if adding a blood pressure medication, carvedilol, to HER2 targeted therapy might reduce the risk of cardiac toxicity in patients with metastatic or 2 positive breast cancer. Participating sites must validate their local echo lab to S1501 before being cleared to enroll. Validation basically entails completing a successful upload of two test echoes to the S1501 echo core lab, just to be sure that the uploads meet the study's specifications. Once the local lab is validated, patients may be screened for eligibility and those moving on to the randomization step are followed for 108 weeks. The study has enrolled 284 participants, just 35% of the planned accrual of 817. S1501 is actively accruing and we need your help to meet this goal. Participation is open to all institutions via SWOG, Alliance, NRG, and ethog Akron. S1820 is under the Palliative Care and End-of-Life Committee. The accrual for S1820 has been met and all participants are in follow-up. This study looks at whether a telephone-based dietary behavioral coaching intervention might help rectal cancer survivors who report struggling with post-surgical bowel symptoms. The primary endpoint for S1820 is the patient reported outcomes and participants receive 10 telephone calls administered by trained health coaches at the University of Arizona Diet Center. The intervention arm delivers targeted coaching calls on diet modification, addressing the participants specific bowel symptoms while control arm participants receive coaching calls on healthy living education. Coaching call intervention for both arms occurs over approximately 16 weeks, and the study team is looking forward to beginning analysis after the final subjects complete the intervention this November. Thank you, Roxanne. I'm Monica Yi, and I'm a uh, project director for Core Data Management and also a data coordinator for S80820, the PACES trial. When you came in, you might have picked up some uh, sticky notes that have adenoma on it or polyp. Uh, we are, uh, as far as the study, we activated in 2013. So if you're looking for a trial to help complete, this is the one. There's no, doesn't hurt to have a little healthy competition here. <laughs> We're in the prevention and epidemiology. Um, committee at SWOG. So we also call ourselves PACES, preventing adenomas of the colon and rectum with aflornithine and selendac. The study is a phase two trial, double blind placebo controlled prevention um, and epidemiology committee trial, as I mentioned, and it hypothesizes that the combination of aflornithine and selendac will be effective in reducing a three-year event rate of adenomas in second primary colorectal cancers in previously treated uh, stages zero to three colon or rectal cancers. This study is 88% of its accrual goal and we need your help to accrue only 47 more participants. It's open to all sites. And uh, so let's complete this trial together. We also have those sticky notes, so please feel free to grab some of those for uh, as many as you want to take back to your office because you'll want to take those back to Seattle with us. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your participation today and on any of our trials. My name is, make sure you guys can hear me here. Uh, my name is Diane Liggett, and I've been in clinical research at SWOG for 24 years. I am currently the data coordinator for two active studies. The first study is S1703, 
This study currently is randomizing patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. We are asking if using serum tumor markers or STMs will affect overall survival compared to the usual care of monitoring the patient's disease with regular imaging. We are also evaluating if STM monitoring is associated with reduced patient scan anxiety, improved quality of life, and lower cost of cancer care compared to usual care. The study is in the cancer care delivery and breast committees. It is open to all networks. We have accrued 18 to 19%, so there's still a lot of opportunity for sites to help boost accrual along with Monica's. As of Monday, we have 367 patients registered out of the 1,320 patients needed for step one. There are 236 patients randomized out of the 1,056 patients needed for step two. To promote this study, we have created a patient flyer, a patient-friendly study summary, and social media toolkit. My newly activated study is S2108CD. This study is unique as it is a cluster randomized study, randomized by Recruitment Center. We will be registering sites, physicians, and patients. This study compares physicians that receive advice from a centralized structured genomic tumor board plus educational materials, or EGTB, to the sites with physicians using usual practice. Our primary goal is to determine whether the EGTB intervention increases the portion of patients who receive evidence-based genomic informed therapy within six months after registration to the study. This cancer care delivery study is limited institution and open to all network in core groups. Currently, we have 16 recruitment centers out of the 18. We are still accepting applications for additional recruitment centers that are in core or minority underserved in core. Our goal is to reg register 126 physicians and 1,182 patients. Finally, detailed information will be presented tomorrow at the S2108CD update meeting. If you are interested in learning more, please join us. Thanks, Diane. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Matt Ng, uh, and I've been with SWOG for two years now. Um, I primarily work on two studies. The first is S1714, um, which was mentioned a little bit earlier. It's an observational study uh, looking to develop a predictive model for peripheral neuropathy in uh, patients who receive taxane-based chemotherapy. Uh, this involves a variety of measures including uh, patient-reported outcomes, as mentioned previously. It also involves neuropathy assessments that use a neuro pen and tuning fork instrument. Um, the study is actually closed now. Um, we met the accrual goal of 1,336 patients uh, back in uh, November of last year, uh, thanks to the efforts of many of you. Um, although follow-up is, is up to three years, on the studies, so we're still looking forward to collecting more data. The other study that I work on is S2013, otherwise known as I Check It. Um, this is also um, a uh, risk prediction um, model study looking at immune related adverse events uh, for patients that receive immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. I check it uh, also uses patient report outcomes and as mentioned previously uh, is one of the first swag studies to use electronic PROs uh, through a downloadable mobile app. The study opened just last year in August with a planned total accrual of a little over 2000 patients. The current number is 469 so we are accruing uh, pretty quickly. Participation is open to all network groups, including ANCOR and NCTN sites, as well as uh, non-US institutions. And with that, I'll pass it on to Manny. Hello. Hello, I am uh, Manny Carbando. I'm a, I've been with SWOG for four years. I've uh, been with this team for four years. Just became a 
data coordinator earlier this year in January, so learning everything that comes with the job. Uh, currently, I work on S1600 with Roxanne Tapascio, who's on the left side of the screen. Uh, it's a trial that evaluates the effect of immune enhancing study drinks on cystectomy outcomes. Currently, there are 150 patients enrolled out of a possible 200, uh, which is the goal. So about 75%. And the goal of S1600 is to compare the impact of uh, consumed study drinks on post-operative complications within 30 days of a of radical cystectomy. Uh, some examples of post-op complications are stuff like uh, quality of life and uh, infections. So S1600 is currently only a U.S. study, and the uh, organizations it includes is SWOG, ECOG Energy, and Alliance. And then I'm also working with on uh, I'm also working on S2205 with Matt Breyer, which is uh, currently in development and opening early next year. Yeah, the study is a randomized trial of limb cryocompression for the prevention of taxane-induced peripheral neuro neuropathy. That's a lot of words. Uh, S2205. Uh, once the study activates, the plan is to enroll 777 patients. So currently, it's not activated. Uh, S225's goal is to compare the different, com uh, the different compressions that will be used to see if they can prevent peripheral neur neuropathy. S225 is also a limited institution trial due to the provisioning of the cryocompression devices, which are the Paxman devices which are used for the trial intervention. S225 is also a U.S. study only, and the participating organizations are SWOG, Alliance, and Energy. All right, everyone, uh, you heard me earlier, but um, uh, I'm Sam Zingle. I'm a clinical research data coordinator at SWOG, uh, SWOG Statistics and Data Management Center in Seattle. Uh, I've been in clinical research now for six years. Uh, I primarily work on S1904, the My Choice study, uh, part of the prevention committee, uh, and also S1912 CD, uh, the credit study, part of the cancer care delivery committee. Uh, both of these studies have very unique study designs. Uh, much like 2108 CD, S1904 is a cluster randomized trial in which the site or recruitment centers are randomized to the trial. Patients enrolled at a site randomized to the control arm will receive standard education materials about breast cancer uh, risk and chemo prevention. Patients enrolled at, at the intervention recruitment center will receive the standard education materials as well as web-based decision support tools. All patients enrolled uh, in S1904 will have a six month visit with their provider. S1904 is limited institution because of the cluster, it is cluster randomized. Um, the study was designed to have 13 recruitment centers at each arm. We've enrolled, we've enrolled all 26 now. Uh, 217 patients have been enrolled of the plan 415, so we're past the 50% mark. And we're still, and we're looking to have accrual closed uh, later in 2023. Um, S1912 CD credit, the credit study looks to provide patients with financial education materials and services so that, be, that they may better navigate the financial and emotional burden that can come with cancer treatment. Uh, with support from our financial counselors at the Consumer Education and Training Services Program, also known as SENSE, as well as support from the Patient Advocate Foundation, patients and their partner caregiver, uh, that are randomized to the intervention arm will have financial education materials as well as the personalized financial navigation coaching. Patient reported outcomes are a large component of measuring financial hardship for the patient caregiver dyad in the study. Uh, because this study is part of the cancer care delivery committee, registration is limited to and core affiliated or sub affiliated sites. One of the unique features of this study in particular is that it requires two separate registrations in open. Uh, one for the patient and one for the partner caregiver, and then linking the two in open. Currently, there are 46, uh, 46 dyads that have been enrolled of the 536 dyads uh, planned. That's, so that's around 9% of total accrual. Uh, so we are actively looking for participants to this trial. So if you're an Encore site, uh, please consider S1912CD. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um... We hope that you have a better understanding of who we are and what function we serve in the larger SWOG research group. As data coordinators, we're passionate and invested these, in these trials as well. Trials that can seem daunting due to how unique each and every one is. 
whether we're investigating the impact of financial toxicity or looking into ways to alleviate taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy. Our goal through all of these studies is to provide you with the information you need to successfully open and run NCORE studies at your sites and to support you through the uh, life of the trial. We may not have all the answers, but we usually know who does. So please reach out to us as your first program of contact at cancercontrolquestion at crab.org. For those of us in Chicago, we hope to meet many of you in person over the next few days. We look forward to working with you to complete these important SWOG and core trials and look forward to any future ideas you may bring to us. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, everyone. Any questions that we have for our data coordinators? Like Kim mentioned, we are the face uh, behind the cancer control question at crab.org, um, being your liaison between uh, the study team and, um, and you has been a real pleasure. But let us know if you have any questions. You can always reach out to us also at cancer control at crab.org. I'd like to introduce next Brenda Ajay. She is a public health advisor and a program director of the NCOR at NCI in uh, cancer care delivery. And she will speak to us about NCOR disparities, integration efforts, learning within and across the network. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And I just wanna say thank you again for the invitation. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about me. Um, as Monica said, I'm a program director I'm in the uh, Office of the Associate Director at NCI in our Healthcare Delivery Research Program. And I'm engaged in a, a few of our uh, equity-centered um, research in, um, initiatives. I'm also a CCDR advisor for uh, many of the um, NCOR sites and the MU sites. Um, and I also have two research bases, so I work more closely with COG and ECOG Akron. Um, and my role in which I'm speaking to you today is as one of the NCI uh, disparities integration leads. Um, and I work closely with Alexis Bacos, as well as Diane St. Germain um, as well. So two other things that I think might be relevant on uh, my background is in health and behavioral studies and also healthcare management. And I've done a lot of work in community-based participatory research. Um, I also happen to be a cancer survivor myself and um, am really uh, committed and passionate about the work that we do. So the objectives for today are to describe the NCOR DIEG goals and strategic activities to share some of our preliminary outcomes and lessons learned and to get some feedback from you, hopefully, regarding some future directions. So before I continue, how many of you have heard of the Disparities Integration Emphasis Group? Hands up. OK. Um, how many of you are on it? All right, I like those same people. All right, since I didn't see too many hands up, you guys got a couple of extra slides that I have to go through, unfortunately, but it's okay. Um, and hopefully virtual group as well. Um, you guys, um, maybe your hands didn't go up as well, but this will be of informative information to you. So as Dawn mentioned, and I think one of the other speakers we have, um, Yvonne mentioned, we have an unprecedented opportunity um, to be able to uh, look uh, squarely in the face of what causes disparities um, and both from COVID as well as um, the events over the past couple of years around social justice, we really have an opportunity to look at what are those drivers and how do we effectively intervene more upstream than we have in the past. We've had a number of reports come out really highlighting the importance of cancer disparities and health equity, as well as even some papers that come out about action, uh, ways that we can actually improve and strategize and um, use some of these evidence-based strategies uh, to implement change. So we're now calling it what it is, right, and looking at what are those systematic and systemic drivers that affect cancer care. And because we've had, again, this real emphasis and call to action, we've also had a supportive legislation um, from the president's office um, in terms of identifying what, who these populations are, who experience disparities and have been historically disadvantaged, as well as funding via the cancer moonshot, as well as, again, some more focused activities. And as you see on this um, column here, really looking at specifically how do we address inequities and ensure that every community in the nation has access to um, 
um, appropriate and quality cancer care. So that fits squarely with the NCOR cancer disparities integration emphasis um, and realizing that NCOR has a legacy um, and history of looking at cancer disparities and incorporating in the programs. And so we seek to integrate uh, cancer disparities research across the network, across our studies and across our activities. And we work through the disparities integration emphasis group as a platform to do that. It's comprised of the integration leads from the research bases, from the community sites, from the MU sites, and all of them bring their strengths, their expertise and their um, experience to improve clinical trial relevance for our diverse populations that are served. So what does that look like in terms of our focus areas? We're looking at our research. As Dawn mentioned, how do we make sure that we're promoting clin clinically relevant and meaningful research studies across our scientific areas? And with studies that are focused exclusively on these disparity populations, as well as in integrating aims in other broader studies. How we're looking at our accrual, ensuring that their part, um, participation and representation of diverse groups, as well as, again, leveraging the community access and expertise um, from our populations, our settings, our investigators, researchers, and patient advocates. The group was initially convened in 2016, so right about as the um, NCOR program started getting uh, their wheels on uh, and moving um, by uh, Dr. McCaskill Stevens, who really recognized that we needed to have a committed platform to look at how we increase our disparities research portfolio and ensure representation in the trials. I already um, um, talked about the membership and our emphasis areas, but some of the past successes have really allowed us to look at our research portfolio a little bit more specifically, identify some ways that we can implement disparities or integration approaches. Um, and uh, we took a little break in 19, 2019 and reconvened. And as part of that effort, we asked our membership, what could we be doing more of to help to engage them so that it wasn't just more meetings, but that they also felt like they were um, participating and really active in this group. So we conducted three listening sessions um, with our research base, our research bases, our site disparities integration leads to obtain some feedback on how do we um, reestablish and again, make sure that we have some more meaningful engagement. Our questions were centered around what are some of the perceived disparities research needs and priorities within NCOR? What are those barriers and challenges that we need to overcome? And how can the DIEG support and address these priorities and challenges? Across our focus area, some of the things that we heard are we need more trials and um, more focus on screening, um, access to novel therapies, the role of social determinants of health um, in trial outcomes. We also need to consider how we're powering trials to make sure that we can uh, actually um, analyze the uh, various uh, um, subgroups, um, as well as implement strategies so that we do um, get the uh, appropriate um, patients enrolled in trials. And so if we set up certain blocks for specific racial and ethnic groups or other um, groups, that we make sure that we've actually met those goals um, before we continue to move along. That we engage our site PIs, um, again at our MUs and across the network to really help to emphasize some of the questions and to let us know what works and what doesn't work in terms of implementation at the sites. And, and again, as, uh, again, as it re relates to some of these trial design factors. In terms of accrual, some of the barriers we learned about were tra um, travel, language, um, even being asked to participate in the first place, which we know um, in the literature is one of the driving factors, as well as comorbidities. We also learned about some other facilitators, how we can share best practice strategies around accrual, community engagement, um, some of the unique things that the research bases are doing around um, disparities committees and site engagement. Again, how do we learn from each other and leverage what we know is working? And we also got some feedback that was also very important around some of the overlap around some of these emphasis areas and making sure that we had measurable objectives so that we know that we're actually achieving what we set out to achieve. And so that's been kind of our strategy, if you will, for how we're moving forward in this current year um, and into the next um, cycle as well. So I want to talk to you today about two of our strategic activities, um, the portfolio analysis as well as our resource matrix. Um, we recently had a research studio 
um, which I see Melissa is here, um, and she had a very active role in that activity. Um, and I think that we're learning more about how to use that platform in addition to and to complement some of the activities that are happening at the research bases to engage uh, diverse perspectives and how to ensure that we're able to meet their cruel needs, understand what those barriers are, and implement some strategies. What I want to talk to you a little bit more about is our self-examination and evaluation of our current NCORE research portfolio, as well as our attempts to uh, create a repository of disparities resources um, for the network as well. So our portfolio analysis, um, a little bit about the aims and approaches. Um, we started off with a pilot just to kind of see how can we identify the studies that are disparities relevant and um, to identify the related research gaps within the portfolio. So that might seem like a very easy thing, but believe me, nothing is that easy, right? Um, so we really had to manually curate and look through these um, protocols to see who were the target um, uh, populations, what was the background and rationale that really led to um, uh, the implementation of these studies, and to create some uh, metrics on, and some monitoring procedures in NCI so that we can flag and then pull out which those studies are. We also um, identified some, some characteristics that we wanted to use to describe the portfolio of disparities relevant research, and then think about how do we move forward in terms of identifying some areas of growth. The approach was that we looked at all of our protocols approved between 2014, the inception of the program that were active, um, as well as through April um, 2021. Uh, we focused on populations of interest, um, and we just really looked at the titles and abstracts of our protocols and included studies that had a primary, again, studies that are specifically looking at disparities research questions in the population and those that have embedded aims um, secondarily in the studies. Some of the characteristics that we outlined as relevant to um, abstract included just some protocol characteristics, year activated, um, lead research based, study status, whether it's active, close to accrual, um, and the scientific scope across cancer prevention, care delivery, and quality of life or symptom control. We looked at some cancer relevant characteristics, including cancer type, continuum, um, specifically active or um, pre uh, active treatment or post treatment, and then the cancer patient populations, whether they were in act, um, diagnosis or whether um, they were metastatic cancers, who, what, what was their cancer relevance. And then study design, um, observational or interventional studies, research methods, cohorts, et cetera. Um, the inclusion of non-patients, as we're seeing a lot of the studies now coming forth specifically for CCDR that are multi-level. Are we looking at patients, caregivers, um, clinicians, organizations? We have some studies that are just organizational level data. And then the study endpoints. And then the disparities relevant, um, the population categories, whether they are health disparities populations or underrepresented populations in research, disparities integration aim, which I've already mentioned in terms of primary or secondary. And then um, informed by the NIMHD um, framework, we used looked at um, health disparities domains and levels, and then language eligibility, um, just to really understand are um, these studies open to um, individuals who speak um, other than English. So we had two coders abstract some of the study protocols. We discussed um, our disagreements, and then I want to share uh, some of the descriptive statistics. And again, this is a pilot, but really kind of helps us to establish the procedures for how we'll move forward. And one of our fellows um, actually presented um, some of this data at the recent AACR conference. So some of our preliminary findings, we had 31 of 101 protocols meet an inclusion criteria. Uh, 25 had a primary uh, uh, integration aim, meaning that they, again, these were studies that are predominantly in that population, um, and six who had secondary aims. Um, in terms of our populations represented, 11 were uh, racial and ethnic minorities, low socioeconomic status, rural, um, and, and those are our NIH health disparities populations, and 20 looking at um, underrepresented, so predominantly um, older adults, AYA, and we did have one study that was looking at um, health literacy as a medically underserved population. In terms of our scope of um, scientific scope, you can see here the different study categories um, and then language availability, which I'm sure is clear to all of you, a majority of our uh, studies are open only to English only patients, which excludes many um, populations as well. 
Some other findings, um, so most of our studies are focusing on multiple or any cancers. Um, and for those that were looking at a single cancer, um, most of them were breast. Um, common cancer related outcomes were really focused around adverse events and toxicities. And most of the patients um, were in active treatment. Uh, it was kind of a split between observational and interventional studies, and most were looking at um, individual um, as well as interpersonal um, uh, level studies and a few and multiple um, levels of influence. So some of the things that we're learning and able to take away from this examination within, um, again, establishing a process to identify and describe our, our portfolio and assess related gaps. Um, we're happy to see that a large number of our studies had um, disparities relevant approaches and focused on several populations of interest. Um, that we're able to describe the portfolio across a number of variables that again speak to some specific um, growth opportunities. And what we want to continue to do is to leverage the strengths within the network, as you all know, NCOR has a very rich history and um, experience base from all of you here um, to identify some act actionable strategies to enhance the portfolio. As we look at the types of variables that we'll look at um, to how do we increase these studies um, with primary or secondary aims, and even for those that have exploratory aims, how do we ensure that we have those signals and maybe move them into more primary or secondary aims. Or um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Unger talked about, how do we use some of the databases and SWAG has done a lot of that to generate some hypotheses driven questions and new studies that might be primary or secondary disparities research studies. How do we look at um, work across NCI to expand a, a language availability and to engage early stage and MU site investigators to generating those questions um, that may, may be of relevance to these populations. So I'm going to transition now to the resource metrics. So hopefully, if you guys have thoughts and comments about the portfolio analysis, please um, keep that in mind, write them down, and so that we you don't forget them as we move into a totally different um, topic. So the resource matrix uh, was a, as it was a, also a strategy to help us think about how can we share what's been happening, what many of you have developed locally within your institutions, within your end course across the network. So we wanted to create a repository of um, disparities focused resources, um, expertise and other assets, and to get feedback about how to better understand what the end course sites and resources um, research bases have need and might contribute in um, support of the DIEG goals. So we convened a resource matrix um, uh, subgroup um, and asked a lot of questions about need, scope, who's the intended audience, the content, organization of this matrix, who's going to use it, um, and support um, for this proposed platform. We defined some matrix examples, as well as drafted a resource information document to help us um, think about, again, what do sites have, need, and want to see in this um, platform. And we're planning to focus that right now on the administrators. And I also want to thank and shout out Ms. Kamara uh, Mertz Rivera, who is our co-chair for that group as well. So the draft uh, resource um, information document, the purpose is it really is a brief survey of the sites and research based administrators. And we recognize that those resources are going to be different at the sites, as well as the research bases, um, but really to assess what um, availability um, what resources exist at the research bases and the sites to help recruit and retain um, populations to understand the gap needs, as well as to obtain input around existing expertise so it's not only about what's on paper, but who can we match people with at institutions to help to answer questions about what's worked what hasn't worked and what we need to be doing more of. And we have the research studios webinars mentoring so a lot of things that we need to identify people really quickly to know who we can um, map. And, and pair people with. So just quickly in terms of resources, we're defining them as any tools, resources, expertise, instruments that might help to facilitate uh, the recruitment, retention, and engagement um, activities and aspects of um, NCORE. Um, and though these are the categories that we're looking at. And um, some examples from written to community partners, community advisory boards, patient advocates, presentations and publications. 
Um, and I was happy to get um, some examples from Monica, um, from SWAG, and some of the things that you guys are doing. And again, you guys know more about these activities than I, but I just kind of tried to plot for them in some of our broader categories around trainings and webinars, some of the best practices that some of the other research bases might want to learn from. And um, I also learned at one of the uh, last meetings about how you use your patient advocates and some of the specific expertise that they bring to um, the research uh, questions um, that you guys are engaged in. So how do we then leverage this um, to, again, learn across the network? Um, some of the work that we've already done is, you know, again, defining these resource categories, types, and examples. We're going to be leaning on our research administ our administrators uh, to help us with um, completing and receiving and responding to the RRI. Um, and we have a plan for how to systematically categorize and code some of these resources. And for some of you, how many of you have heard of AccruelNet? that used to exist. Okay, so one, okay. Oh, Dr. Berenberg, we're dating ourselves. <laughs> so um, we're hoping to use a similar type platform or some type of organizational framework and not build from scratch to help us think about how do we um, manage um, these resources that come in. And I do wanna include here an important caveat is to evaluate the scope of work, right? So this could really get really big, so really thinking about what are some of those key resources that sites and bases can use. Um, and work with our subgroup to review the data, establish the platform and some um, uh, standard operating procedures, disseminate the RRI, and then get some call for resources so that we can start to populate. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot of some of the systematic coding that we might employ. Um, and this I borrowed from our AccruelNet and some of our other NIH um, resource repositories. I want to thank our resource matrix um, and a special thanks also to Monica and Dr. Allison Caden Holt for inviting me uh, and to be able to share a lot of this work. Um, and just some closing thoughts. And I think uh, just hearing the presentations from today, we know um, it, it just kind of reflects SWAG and, and NCORE as well. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Um, and then I also found this by Judge Jones, what gets measured gets done, what gets measured and fed back gets done well, and what gets rewarded gets repeated. So I thought those were two good ones to really guide the work that the Disparities Integration Emphasis Group is trying to move forward in all of our work as well. So I want to say thank you and um, look forward to hearing any feedback you might have on how we could continue this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. Appreciate your uh, presentation. Do we have any questions in the audience? There's one comment uh, question from, oh, I'm sorry, is it Kamara? Okay. Hi, Kamara from Upstate Carolina Incor. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Brenda, for um, putting what seems really complex into um, simple terms for us. Going back to the portfolio analysis, I'm fascinated because I'd love to do a portfolio analysis for all the studies we have. We're touching about 200 studies at um, our Incor. What do you see from the 31 that you pulled going forward, recommendations for trials that could incorporate? Is, is that like the bottom line that you're looking to provide guidance to the investigators prior to creating their, um, their protocol? So I think through a combination of the activities, we will hopefully be able to get at guidance. For the portfolio, what we're trying to also see is where are some areas where we need to shore up some of the studies. Um, and increase our overall portfolio. So 30% is really good. I think that, um, this is Brenda Ajay's comment, um, most of our studies um, should be asking the question, who are the populations that are being excluded and what are the disparities that are relevant? Um, and not the opposite way, right? So it should be, let's ask what the disparities research question is or incorporate um, even exploratory aims to help us understand what are some of the things that are happening in these communities that we know are again uh, receiving, uh, you know, are disproportionately burdened by cancer? And so that's what we're trying to do to increase the overall um, portfolio of disparities research questions across all of the studies and have that be kind of the norm versus the exception. Thank you. 
Thank you. We have um, some comments in the chat. Uh, one from Katie Arnold from Seattle Statistics and Data Management Center. Um, this is pertaining to the portfolio analysis in slide 13, the preliminary findings. Um, this is just, it's a question about what were the reasons that studies were open to English speaking patients only? Pros maybe, and to clarify, consent documents can be translated. Seems odd that so many studies are limited to English speakers. Yes, yeah, so what we looked at was in the eligibility criteria, so that these studies explicitly stated English speaking only. So that was the, our um, uh, criteria for putting them in, in the language category. Um, let's see if I understand the second piece of the question. Um, while we do have the ability to provide the short term the consent, we know that these questionnaires are not available, so it does limit people's participation in the study. If they don't understand what the study is about, they don't have the interpreter. So I think what we want to do is, again, try to think about ways that we can be more inclusive. I recognize that there are um, resources that are needed to be able to do a lot of this work, um, but I think that's part of our work as well to understand what those strategies are. Diane St. Germain at um, NCI has been doing a lot of that work around language accessibility. And so just thinking about what else can we be doing um, so that we are more yeah, inclusive. Yeah, I'll make it cut. So hopefully that answers your question, um, Ms. Arnold. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to cut. Is there another question? Thanks, Manny. Oops, careful. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You okay? Mommy's butt? You okay? Thanks so much, Brenda, okay. for that wonderful talk. I have a question on one of the slides. You talked about disparities integration on trials. What does that mean? Like, so what does that look like? Does it look like they, can you break that down a little bit? Yeah. So what we're talking about when we're talking about di primary disparities, so that we define that as the study is open, it's primarily targeting a research question in a specific population that is either a NIH health disparities population or underrepresented in research. So for an example, our OptiSurge study, that is for individuals who are 70 and over, so we know that's primarily targeting older adults, a study that's looking in rural populations. We also have studies, though, that it's really about understanding how decisions are made around specific cancers, but a secondary might aim, meaning that it's also powered to answer that question, is also asking how does that different, differ across racial and ethnic populations. So that's kind of the distinction between primary and secondary. Threats. Okay, thank you. And then one other question. Did the, did the group look at the landscape survey data yet? We did not. Um, so we know that that, that has happened uh, now three times, um, and that helps us to complement a lot of the activities so that bases also have a sense of the disparities research capacity at sites. So when you're when they're trying to build these studies and they want to go to sites that either have these populations, um, have the, uh, uh, the ability to look at social determinants of health, they know who, which sites are able to do that. So we do see that as a very complementary effort. Thank you. Brenda, could you explain the landscape survey to those who are not in core sites sure. in the audience? So our landscape survey is one of the um, features, I would say, of the CCDR program. It is led out of um, Wake Forest um, in collaboration with the other research bases. So it's a very collaborative effort to understand the CCDR capacity in terms of services, um, resources, and um, uh, various attributes, if you will, um, to be able to answer uh, CCDR care delivery research questions. So some of the questions they ask about, and uh, before I continue, how many of you have seen the landscape survey, have done it? Okay, so many of you know a lot of the questions, do you have an EHR? Um, which EHRs do you have? Do, which type of questions do you ask around um, caregiving? So again, it helps us to understand what types of studies um, investigators who are thinking about work um, in NCORE might be able to do and which sites, um, again, are doing or have capacity in those areas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. All right, our final presenter is Dr. Scott Ramsey. He's study chair of the S1415 CD Tracer trial and co-chair of the CCDR committee. He's going to be discussing uh, track, tracing tracer lessons learned from SWOG's first large pragmatic trial in cancer care delivery. All good? All right. Thanks. 
Hi, everybody. I know I'm your closer today, so I'm going to try to keep this a little bit fun and move through it so we can uh, move on to the next set of things we're doing here uh, at, at the SWOG meeting. But I think you'll find this kind of an interesting uh, overview of what, for me, was a really rewarding, challenging, and interesting trial, uh, Tracer, SWOG 1415CD. So let me give you a little bit of background on what this was designed to address. So at the time we wrote uh, this study, uh, it was known that uh, primary prophylactic colony stimulating factors like nupogen and Olasta were prescribed to patients receiving chemotherapy to reduce the risk of febrile neutropenia. But the way they were being prescribed at the time this trial uh, was started was really not at all in line with guidelines. In fact, guidelines had suggested that 55, or um, studies have suggested that 50 to 95% of patients weren't getting these drugs the way they were recommended in guidelines. And at this point, the guidelines had been out for um, at least 15 years. So um, the other big uh, issue that this trial was designed to address was the impact of these drugs in patients receiving intermediate risk chemotherapy. So there's high risk chemotherapy, very high risk for febrile neutropenia, low risk ch chemotherapy, both of those were fairly settled issues, but this issue of what is the benefit of, the, of, of these products for intermediate risk, we needed to have a look at that. So this study was designed as a pragmatic cluster randomized trial, and I'll explain what that is in a second, to determine if guideline informed standing orders improve prescribing of these prophylactic colony stimulating factors and if they actually achieve what they're supposed to do, which is reduce the incidence of febrile neutropenia. So the trial had a primary outcome of primary prophylactic CSF use and a secondary outcome of febrile neutropenia incidence within six months of initial therapy. So let's start with the first part of this study. What's a pragmatic trial? They're, they're often called large simple trials um, and they're really as, as opposed to an efficacy trial, like we might see with an FDA registration trial or even many SWOG drug trials, this is really designed to understand the effectiveness of an intervention in real life routine practice with all of its messiness. So to get that way, we had to have broad eligibility criteria, which I'll explain, and really as light a touch on clinical practice as possible. So that included both the intervention, um, which I'll explain, and how we monitored patients over time. And finally, we want these endpoints to be of interest to practicing doctors. So, you know, they should be able to look at this study and say, oh, I should do this or not do this in my practice. Now, what about cluster randomization? So this is a type of randomization scheme where the random randomization unit is the clinic or a larger entity than, than the patient or the clinician. And it's a good choice if it's really hard to do patient level randomization. Uh, it's either infeasible or if there's a real high risk of contamination of randomizing patients within clinics. In other words, you know, doing something to one group would make it really easy to identify, you know, what's going on by the patient and or the clinician in a way that would, you know, kind of make the study uh, potentially contaminated. Now, it's, it's a good approach and it's being used now more and more often even in oncology, especially since Tracer, but it's not easy to do cluster randomization. First of all, if you're randomizing at the clinic level, you have to have enough clinics to randomize. And that gets to be a problem um, if there's correlation between patients within sites. And there always is correlation of patients within sites. It's just a matter of degree. That's estimated by something called the interclass correlation coefficient. Um, and the more correlation there is, the larger number of clinics that you would need to test your hypotheses. And as you'll see, we had uh, a lot of clinics in this uh, study, um, and you know, it was it was challenging just to get the clinics that we needed to prove our to test our hypotheses. So this is what the study looked like. This is the study schema. So we started with the MCORP CCDR sites. Um, and we basically divide them into two groups. There were a group that already had automated order entry systems that were designed to, you know, basically give colony stimulating factors based on some algorithm. 
And so those people weren't eligible for the study because that's what we were testing this algorithm. So we found those sites that had the algorithms and we put them into a cohort that's over on your left hand side. And those that didn't have algorithms, we randomized three to one into usual care, which is just keep doing what you're doing, or an intervention, which is where we actually went in and modified their electronic health records to add alerts for the uh, patients to receive or not receive these colony stimulating factors based on the regimen that the, the doctor typed in to the order system. Um, and you can see we had eight sites in usual care. We had three times as many in the intervention. There were 13 sites in the cohort group. But we also had a second sub-randomization within the intervention. And this one was to test this hypothesis about the benefits of these drugs in intermediate risk chemotherapy. So if patients were receiving intermediate risk chemotherapy, they were randomized to one of two arms. And one arm was basically that the orders auto-populated colony stimulating factors, and everyone in that in those clinics got it. Um, now the physician could override that order, but it was put in there as, as a matter of course. In the control arm, there was an alert that came up say, suggesting not to do not to put in colony stimulating factors and it wasn't auto populated. But again, the physician could override that at their discretion. So what we ended up needing for all of this was 90 patients per site. That would give us 80% power to test the hypothesis that we'd reduce the FN febrile neutropenia risk from uh, in half from 15% to seven and a half. Um, and I won't go into the analysis here. We can talk about that later if you're interested. So what were the results? Uh, and I'm happy to say that these are gonna be coming out this month, I believe, in, in a JCO and JAMA network open. Um, so we ended up recruiting uh, 3,600 uh, patients, over 3,600, and that was our recruitment goal. And I'll just say as an aside, we did that through the finish line of the COVID pandemic. So I was really um, proud of the clinics for, for finishing this. Um, so these were breast, colorectal, and lung cancer patients. Their average age was 58. You can see the majority um, were breast cancer patients um, and followed by uh, colorectal and lung cancer patients. Now here is the uh, take home, what we found. So adherence, it turned out that adherence was much, much higher than we had estimated. So in the usual care, not doing anything arm, adherence in high risk was 95%. We predicted it would be far lower than that. Interestingly, in the intervention group, and remember the intervention group got the auto-populated order to put in colony stimulating factors, it was actually slightly lower. So what that meant is the physicians were undoing some of those orders. In contrast, the low risk, again, we saw lots of overuse in low risk in, in prior studies, observational studies, use of colony stimulating factors in the low risk group was actually quite low. In the usual arm, it was 5.5%. Again, a fraction of what we saw in ob observational studies. Um, and it was actually worse, slightly worse, not statistically worse, in the intervention arm. Again, the doctors had to override and give colony stimulating factors for this low risk population. So ultimately, this part of the study was negative. It, it did not suggest that these order entry systems improve practice. And in fact, practice was already pretty good um, at the time. And we can talk about why that was. Um, we also looked at the febrile neutropenia rates and they were not st statistically significantly different. I will say in the high risk group, you'll see there, those are pretty small numbers uh, for febrile neutropenia. Again, lots of people getting colony stimulating factors. So they were doing what they were supposed to do and very low numbers for febrile neutropenia in the low risk group there on the bottom. So that's the sort of negative aspect, although I, I, I'll challenge that a little bit if you wanna talk about that. The intermediate risk study was a little more interesting. What we found was that this was 524 patients who received intermediate risk chemotherapy regimens. And what we found is that in the sites that were randomized to auto-populate with colony stimulating factors, there was a much higher likelihood that the doctors uh, would accept that and that there was more prescribing in that arm. Although notice 37.1% is not 100%. So they were overriding these orders as well. But notice in the usual care where there was an alert not to prescribe, it was much, much lower, 
But notice the febrile neutropenia rates here. So we asked, well, all the guidelines estimate that in this category, the febrile neutropenia rates somewhere between 10 and 20%. We found febrile neutropenia rates that were 3.7%. And in fact, they were similar in both arms and it didn't matter where the patients got colony simulating factors or not. It was all in this high three to low 4% number, much, much lower than the guidelines had said was the rate in this population. So in summary, we found that these standing orders didn't uh, influence uh, primary uh, prophylactic CSF use, um, didn't increase it in the high risk group, didn't decrease it in the low risk group, group, but it did seem to influence prescribing in this intermediate risk where doctors knew there was some uncertainty. Um, so that kind of suggests to me that in a situation where there's clinical equipoise, these guidelines can have some impact. Um, the, the guideline adherence was better than we predicted, um, and the systems didn't really impact febrile neutropenia, which is what our ultimate endpoint was. All that said, in this intermediate risk group, um, the rates were much lower than we predicted and didn't really differ, didn't matter whether you got colony stimulating factors or not. So one of the things we took home from this is where, there, where there's established evidence, and again, there'd been multiple years of guidelines, these, these standing orders didn't really prove out to be helpful or effective. So we spent a lot of time doing this, and that's okay, uh, but in the end, they didn't make much of a difference. But in this situation where there was limited evidence and some equipoise, these orders might be useful to guide practice in a way that allows us to really understand how the uh, product works um, and, and can give evidence that can guide decision making. So that that basically is a summary of the papers that are coming out. Now I want to talk a little bit about you know the trial itself and what we experienced in the winds and so on. So um, this was the first study randomized prospective study that really was designed to test the the usefulness of these drugs in modern intermediate risk regimens. And it's kind of ironic, these, these regimens are modern, have been around for many, many years, um, and no one has bothered to look at this, even though we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on these drugs. So that, to us, is a big win. We think that's a practice-changing result. Um, for SWOG and for the community that does these studies, this was the first cancer care delivery study that was a pragmatic cluster randomized trial. Uh, and so we have set a precedent in SWOG, and I can tell you that precedent is being followed. Others are designing studies in this vein in other areas of cancer care delivery, and that's uh, exciting to us. Um, we also felt, even though the, the electronic health record order entry system was, didn't influence practice, we were able to implement that system, and we implemented it in seven different EHRs. And in fact, in three clinics, we actually implemented on paper. They didn't have electronic health records. I didn't know you could do that anymore in medicine, but apparently you can. So, um, you know, just doing that, showing that you could do something like that, I think uh, is, is remarkable. Um, we also met our recruit recruitment um, uh, target. We had very low dropout. We had excellent representation of Hispanic patients. Um, thanks in part to our Puerto Rico site, who just did a wonderful job. Um, and, you know, overall, um, this, the recruitment uh, really went well. So for, for me, and I think for the investigators, you know, we would have loved to have seen a big impact for our order entry system, but we saw a lot of other wins, and we were really pleased with that. But now I'm going to kind of switch and just talk about kind of how we went through this trial and some of the things that we encountered and I'm kind of couching this in terms of a few lessons learned. Uh, for those of you that might want to get into this game of doing cancer care delivery research um, or pragmatic trials. So one of the first things that we sort of encountered when we were talking up this trial is, you know, is this science? You're doing this sort of wishy-washy pragmatic trial on an order, you know, on colony stimulating factors that have been around for years. Um, you know, why aren't we doing, you know, newest drug trials? And, you know, the problem was that these, these drugs were not being used correctly. Uh, multiple studies had shown that. Uh, and there was a potential was harming patients. And in the intermediate risk case, we didn't even know what was happening with those individuals. So 
there was a real need to do this, but we had to find clinician champions who could, you know, articulate that need um, and, you know, go out there and convince their other colleagues that this was worth doing. Um, we also, you know, have to show the data. So, you know, leaders are thinking about the, that the problem of poor ad adherence doesn't apply to them. I had many clinics saying, oh, you know, we follow these guidelines. Um, but, you know, we had data from, from the United States showing that that wasn't the situ situation. So, you know, we had to note that the problem impacts patient lives and costs money. And, and this is where the patient advocates became so important because, you know, when we explained this to them, they had stories about being prescribed these drugs, what it cost them, um, you know, the uncertainty and the lack of information that was conveyed uh, sometimes to them when they were at the point of prescribing. And they thought the study was important. And I actually think their voice helped to carry the day and get this study accept accepted. The second lesson learned is, I mean, honestly, going into this, I thought once we get the, got this thing set up, it would, we would cruise, it wouldn't be too, too hard because it's such a simple trial. Well, it turns out it's not a simple trial at all. Changing practice is really hard. Um, and we had to spend a whole lot of time with the sites um, to help them digest and implement uh, the intervention that we were uh, putting together. So, and this is not a knock on the sites. I mean, this is something they're not used to doing. And in fact, that's why it was so hard. But again, having those site champions and patient advocates was just critical to our success. Um, the other thing we learned is, and for those of you who are out there, I, I get it now, it is chaos out there in oncology. I mean, practices are merging, changing personnel, directors leaving. It was the norm that we would start with one clinic director and then have another one when the study was over. Um, and you know, things were coming up all the time. And so my team was, was doing weekly check-ins with all the clinics just to make sure that everything was on track and to help problem solve uh, because there was so much just stuff going on in these clinics. We also found that the practice's ability to kind of get the trial done, to enroll patients and get them in on was, was highly variable. Some just got it done and they were done, you know, very quickly. Others just took forever and it was no secret that it was correlated with some of the chaos that was going on, changes in leadership or ownership um, of the practices. So we had to spend a lot of time on a few clinics and then some of the others just did their thing. Um, and you know what, the stakes are higher, right? We're not randomizing patients. So if we lose a few patients, you know, in a, in a normal patient randomized trial, well, you can, you know, maybe extend the study, get some more, whatever. But if you lose a clinic, it's not so easy to get another clinic, right? And we had basically all the clinics we could get. So the stakes were really high. If we had clinics drop out, it was gonna be a big deal for us to be able to test our hypotheses. So donuts are always helpful. <laughs> this is another lesson we learned. We eat them, we send them out, we do, whatever we need to do to make sure clinics understand that they mean a lot to us. Um, and, you know, a little sugar never helps us, never, never hurt anybody get through the day. The other thing is that, you know, we had to be ready to be flexible. Um, you know, there was, every clinic had a different workflow and a different setting and different patients with different needs. And we had to be flexible with our interventions. As I said, you know, we didn't expect there to be paper-based orders out there, but three clinics had that. So we had to translate what was on the computer into something that those folks could use on paper. Um, and that, you know, that credit goes to my staff and just getting that done, it was not easy. Um, and we also, you know, there was stuff to learn along the way. And we had regular meetings here at the SWOG uh, group meetings uh, while this was going on for the practices to come together in a room like this and share their trips, tips and tricks on how they could recruit patients and, and get this trial done. Um, and that was, that was just hugely important. And you know, at the end of the day, getting the sites to participate really made it, made it possible. Um, you know, we had 38 NCORP sites and seven minority underserved NCORP sites. 
uh, that represented 25 US states and territories. Um, Puerto Rico, which was a site, experienced a hurricane, which wiped out their power system during this, and they kept recruiting. I mean, those are the kind of things that we were encountering. Um, but, you know, the cluster randomized design, to, we, we had to have those sites that agreed enroll. And so, you know, it wasn't what's wrong with you. It's like, what can we do for you? It really had to be focused on enabling the clinics to do what, you know, what they could do to enroll patients. Um, all those intervention, intervention sites were able to modify their order systems, um, and that was the site champions, and it was the doctors and the CRAs and everyone else who believed in us that allowed this to happen. Um, and as I said, the NCORP research staff participated in panel discussions and provided feedback, um, and we actually iterated on the study recruitment materials. You can imagine explaining this study to patients might be a little challenging. Again, our patient advocates had a huge role in explaining the importance. So I think Tracer is going to be influential down the line, yet, yet to be proven because we're just getting out the papers now. Um, I do think on the clinical side, what we found for intermediate risk is it has to change the guidelines because there just isn't as much uh, febrile neutropenia in those, uh, for those uh, combination therapies. Um, and I think you know, that's gonna affect NCCN and, and ASCO and the others that come up with these uh, guidelines. Um, you know, for health systems, you know, there's a big push to put into these automated order entry sets. I mean, I deal with them in primary care, you guys deal with them in oncology. Um, you know, they're kind of done a lot without the expect, or with the expectation that they're gonna work and we don't have to test that. Maybe this'll give a little pause before all those resources uh, and frankly, provider time is put into making these changes. Now, I think for those of us in the trial community, SWOG and the other group trials, they were big wins. I mean, this, I think, is a game changer for adopting the pragmatic trial, mo trial model in, um, in SWOG and the other groups. Um, I have to say, I, I am totally enthusiastic about bringing patients in at the very start of these studies as equal advisors in how to design a study. They, their role was so critical to our success. And I would strongly encourage anyone who's involved in the trial to bring patients in, sit them down, and listen very carefully what they have to say about the situation that you're considering for a trial. And I think for the NCORPS, it, it, it has changed a little bit the idea of what can be done um, in this network. And I think it now is an opportunity for this large network of clinics to get into something that they haven't been done before. I wanna give a big thankful thank you to the sites that participated. These are the unsung heroes. Again, they, they, they put up with a lot with this study while they were dealing with a lot. Um, and you know, they were the ones who helped us achieve our recruitment goal. And then of course, um, the chairs, the biostatistical team, we had a group of external stakeholders from around the country that advised us Again, critical advice at every point. Um, and then our research staff, the folks with me at the Fred Hutch um, and around the country who just got it done. Um, I'm so grateful to them for all they did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, Manny, there's a question there from Melissa. Before I ask my question, I just want to say that um, <clears throat> this study actually, I was in charge of it at Spartanburg, and we were one of the cohort sites, so I enrolled 60 patients, and it really lit a spark in me about cancer care delivery research, which has gone on to be my career. Um, and I just thank you for that, because I loved the idea that we could implement evidence-based practice you know, things that needed to be done, we could study how to implement that. And so thank you for that. But but my question is, I noticed, and I may be looking at this incorrectly, but it seemed like the cohort sites actually had worse, uh, <laughs> worse outcomes, even in the intermediate, which is that statistically significant? Has that been is there a way to go back? looked at? I can't make this thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, let's go to slide six or so. Well, you're at 20 right now. 
Yeah, go to six and then. Um, so my recollection was that the cohort site adherence, is, did you say adherence? Well, it looked like um, the patients that had the high um, high risk chemotherapy, that their, their rates um, of febrile neutropenia were actually worse. <laughs> and then also the low. Um, so the FN rates was what overall was 6.5% in the cohort versus um, 4.2 in the usual care and 6.1. That was not statistically significant. Is, is that is that what you mean? But see, see the cohort, 10 of 121, 8.3%. It's higher than all the rest. And if you look up at the high risk, yeah. um, it, it, it just makes me wonder, like, were we doing, you know, <laughs> why did we have worse outcomes than anyone else? Well, you, you notice that your adherence to CSF use was 93% in the cohort for high risk and 8.3% in the low risk. So it was a little worse than you'd want in co-risk. It was kind of overused, but in the high risk, it was right there in the middle between um, the, inter the usual care and the intervention. Um, we, uh, we haven't yet really dug deep into the cohort uh, groups to understand what's going on. Um, but our, our first, first, first of all, these numbers were not statistically significantly different. They're numerically a bit different. Um, but what we um, we haven't really taken away uh, what what you know what really was going on and, and remember that everybody had a different system and it was all over. Yeah. Well, it may well be that um, it was given differently or different drugs were used. We just haven't do dove into that. And, you know, talk to me sometime. We can get you involved if you want to be in, in that part of the study. <laughs> okay. Um, no questions online at all from virtual. Okay. That's it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey, once again for coming. He just flew in just an hour ago. So thank you very much for making it. Um, our next workshop is next year, always planning ahead. So um, in 2023, we hope to be here October 11th. So please join us. Um, we would appreciate if you could complete your feedback form, if you have any ideas for topics that you would like to hear about, or if you would even like to be a presenter or a, a breakout session presenter, uh, we would appreciate if you'd fill that form out, put your name and information on there. Each workshop for the fall for the NCORE is, uh, we have different topics. So we're looking forward to hearing more from you about things um, and areas that you would like to hear about. And uh, with that, I think we are uh, done giving you back some life work balance. I would like to encourage all of you in Region CC at 430. There is a great um, session that's going to be happening uh, sponsored by the Recruitment and Retention Committee. It's the Take Action Symposium, which is this time around going to feature three guest speakers on uh, Hispanic Latinx populations, ensuring equity in clinical research. So you have uh, about 45 minutes to take a break and then head on in there if you can. It's from 4.30 to 5.30. Um, other than that, we really appreciate everything that you do. We echo everything the presenter said today about your participation and your efforts in all of our trials. Reach out to us, talk to us, um, and we look forward to meeting you throughout the session. Please come and talk to our data coordinators. And thanks very much. Have a wonderful rest of the group meeting. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Oh, yes. And uh, this evaluation forms, you can just drop them off um, at the front sign in desk. Thank you.